Yes, sir. I radioed for backup, got out of my patrol vehicle, and approached the defendant's vehicle. Then when did you search for the gun? Objection. Absolutely no foundation. Furthermore, the prosecutor, though well-meaning, is leading the witness just a trifle. Sustained. Please rephrase your question. What happened that night, officer? Objection. Now counsel is calling for a narrative. Sustained. Rephrase. Did you see anything as you approached the defendant's vehicle? Yes. Located in plain view under the back of the driver's seat was what appeared to be the stock of a rifle or shotgun. I immediately ordered the defendant out of his vehicle and retrieved the weapon. Did you examine the weapon? Yes, I did. It was a 12-gauge shotgun. The barrel was warm and it smelled. Well, Frank, we've been expecting you. When did you get in? Uh, just now. Uh, how are we doing? We're all doing fine. Hmm. Courtroom of the future, huh? That's what we hope. First time you've seen it? Actually, yes, I've been over the plans a dozen times, but I wanted to get a look at it before the uh, dedication. Because I really want to see Frank Jr. in action. Now, how does all this video work? Well, the courtroom is configured so that the jury faces the proceedings. Notice the television monitor in front of them. Oh, miss a beat. Huh? If the attention of any one of the jury stray from the proceedings, he can immediately focus on the monitor, which is covering the action. From this room, they record every single thing that goes on in the courtroom. I should get you an assistant. Hey, the way I got this place rigged, nobody can run it but me. Keeps me indispensable. <laughs> Let's go. <Yeah. clears throat> the shotgun was located in plain view. Now, you're telling us, Sergeant, that a man who's been painted by the prosecution as having planned his entire crime with military precision... Speeds from the vicinity of the crime at 90 miles an hour with the alleged murder weapon in plain view? <laughs> Do you think we are idiots here? Is it not true, sir, that last year in three separate criminal trials, you testified to discovering evidence in plain view and that subsequent investigation revealed that you had indeed planted such evidence? And weren't you subsequently tried for perjury? What? Mr. Wellman, you're out of order. I'm not out of order. Answer the question. Yes, I was tried for perjury, but I was acquitted. The jury will disregard this last piece of testimony. You can't instruct the jury to disregard. There's been no objection and no motion to strike. The court makes its own objection and orders the testimony to be stricken. Therefore, the jury will disregard. Satisfied, Mr. Wellman? And where are your objections, Mr. Prosecutor? Hmm? Don't let all this power go to your head, Jeff. I'm through. We'll stand recess until tomorrow. <laughs> well, I call that aggressive advocacy. And I'd agree with you. Uh, sorry, Frank, but I have to get back to work. I really appreciate you coming to teach a seminar. I know Frank Jr. feels the same about having you for a teacher. I'll be seeing you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Want to have dinner? Yeah, all right. No, you know, I, I, I'd better stay back here and, and work on my summation a little bit. It's okay. Well, breakfast at my hotel. Okay? All right. And give him hell, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't believe what I just saw. It borders on the incomprehensible. Mr. McDonald, you had grounds for objection. Mr. Wellman badgered your witness and extracted inadmissible evidence. Now, where were you? I thought if I gave Frank enough rope, he'd hang himself. That isn't good enough. I expect Scott thought that the judge would have called Frank on it. Miss McDonald, you're his sister, and your loyalty is commendable. But, Mr. McDonald, as a prosecutor, your duty is to prevent defense counsel from misusing the rules of evidence. Don't smile, Frank. If Jeff had been doing his job, you'd be cited for contempt. I agree. You're clever and articulate, Mr. Wellman. 
But a jury is a complex organism, just a group of ordinary people. They haven't studied Aristotelian logic. Their individual honesty may come and go as it does for all of us. When they become a jury, they take on an intelligence that you must never underestimate and an integrity that you must never, never insult. Until tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you for your comments, Mr. Mason. It is an honor being in your class. I'll remember what you said. Thank you. And Frank. When you make your summation tomorrow, use some sincerity. Ted! Look, I know I've been remote, but I need to see you. Well, that's quite a change. Don't make it any more difficult, please. Okay. Okay. How about now? I'm sorry, I can't. Scott and I have some things to do. Kimberly, what is the matter? Why can't you just come out and tell me? Ken, why don't you give her a break? Scott, please. Just try to understand. I'd like to. Last week, you were in love with me. Now I can't get you on the phone. I leave messages in your study, Carol, which you don't return. If it weren't for this damn mock trial, I wouldn't see you at all. Kim. Don't listen to your brother. For once, do what you want. Come see me tonight. I don't get it. Around 7 o'clock, okay? con law exam or how about those broncos or maybe ken the reason i've been treating you so bad is because i'm schizo i'll be in the library well this was a mistake i'm sorry i never should have had you come kimberly tell him tell him wait a minute just leave her alone, Wait Ken. A minute. Just leave her What's alone. With her? What's going on? It's Frank. He's the reason she's been acting so strange. What's he got to do with it? I probably shouldn't be telling you this. But a couple of nights ago, he came up to her in the library and he wanted to talk to her about some pretrial motions for the uh, moot court. Moot court doesn't have pretrial motions. No kidding. But you know that he's been crazy about her since the first year, right? Anyway, they went over to the Ivy to have some beers. Before you know it, he's drunk, too drunk to drive, and uh, she had to drive him home. Go on. 
all of a sudden he uh he threw her down on the floor ripped open her blouse and tried to rape her he didn't no she fought him off but he he really hurt her i mean i woke up because i heard her crying in the bathroom she made me promise not to say anything she was so scared ken that's the reason she hasn't wanted to see you she's afraid that all the ken I couldn't see who it was. Whether it was a man or a woman. Are you aware it was your knife that was used to kill him? My knife? It had your initials on it. Mr. Mason, someone stole that knife from me two weeks ago. You don't believe me? There are several top defense attorneys in Denver. I'll speak to one first thing in the morning. I called you. Ken, I'll find you the very best. Look, sir. I want to be a lawyer. I worked hard to get into this school and I don't want it taken away from me for something I didn't do. You always told us that the accused is entitled to the best possible defense. And you're the best defense attorney I could have. I'm innocent, damn it. And I, just, and I need someone to believe that. Mostly you. School Perry, yours and mine. Gets killed here. Frank, don't think about it. You would have been a good lawyer, wouldn't you? More than good. We had our problems. Any kid does today. I was so proud of him. He was doing such a terrific job. Turned his whole life around. The 
young man accused of the murder phoned me. I went to see him. He confessed? He wants me to represent him. What did you say? I told him no. I'm not sure it was the right thing to do. No. It's other good lawyers. He asked for me. Frank, if I walk away from this young man... Because of our friendship. Hmm? Now, isn't that enough? I don't know. And next in order, People versus Ken Melansky. Are the people ready? Marilyn Anson of the District Attorney's Office. The people are ready, Your Honor. And do you have counsel, Mr. Melansky? No, Your Honor. And this proceeding will be put over. If it's a matter of expense, the state will provide a lawyer. Do you wish this court to appoint one for you? That won't be necessary, Your Honor. I recognize you, Mr. Mason. And what are you doing here? I'm representing the defendant. Understated, yet beautiful. Roses are absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. I was describing you. The roses are the least I could do for cutting your trip short. Oh, the cruise. Mm-hmm, yes. Starry nights, tropical skies, gourmet food, and the best big band since the immortal Glenn Miller. After four days, I was so bored I could have jumped ship, even without your call. I am more than appreciative. Mm -hmm. How are you? And uh, how's poor Mr. Wellman? Well, Frank's taking taking it very hard. Uh, his boy mm -hmm. was his whole life. Della, I want you to look into Frank Jr.'s past. See who else might have had a motive. Any idea where to start? Two days before the murder, he allegedly tried to rape Ken Melansky's girlfriend. Allegedly? Her name's Kimberly. Kimberly McDonald. She's also a law student. Same class as Frank Jr. I want you to talk to Kimberly. Ryan. Perry. How does Frank Wellman feel about this? I, I mean, you're representing Ken Malinsky. He doesn't know yet. Ooh. I'm going to need all the background you can get me on the students in my class. Mm -hmm. Give me 10 minutes, I'll be right on it. I want you to rent a car. Meet me at the courthouse. Ken's being arraigned this afternoon. Anything else? Why, yes. There's a list on the desk. We have two choices. One is to ignore the tragedy that occurred here. The way we've been sitting here pretending that tape isn't there? Or we can look closely at all of it. You mean make Ken's defense part of the class? Not exactly. But there's a great deal we can learn from what's happened. But suppose Ken's lying. Suppose he's actually guilty. Every defendant comes into court presumed innocent. Now, what's my first line of attack? 
Ken said someone was already here when he came in. Besides Frank, I mean. Well, if Ken didn't do it, then that man was the murderer. Or a woman. A good start. However, the security guard claims he was on duty all night. He let no one else in here except Frank. Where does that leave us? In deep trouble. The classic murder in a locked room. Then what becomes the critical question? Where the person hid? Mr. McDonald? No. Who knew Frank would be here that night? Very good. Who would have known? The only people who'd know for sure would be the people in this class. Who else? You knew. Yes, I did. And Frank's father? And the security guard? All right, let's strike the three of us from the list of suspects. What is your inevitable conclusion? One of us is the killer. But we all left together. Did you? I left with Scott. And then we both saw Ken outside. Did anyone see me leave? I ran into you at the cafeteria. Fine, then we're each other's alibi. Yes. That leaves me. I left alone. Actually, I saw you from the window of my office getting into your car in the parking lot. If nobody hid in here, where does that leave us? Miss Lehman. There's got to be another key. Right. So one of us has to be the killer. Right. Now, please consider that until our next meeting. In fact, since I'm now defending Ken Malansky, Expect me to intrude on each one of you at any time. That's all, thank you. Congratulations. What for? Getting our interest. You certainly put us all in the middle of Ken's defense. And your own. The um, court has reviewed counsel's motion for bail, as well as the people's response. We find the defendant has no ties to this jurisdiction beyond his enrollment in school here. No residence, no job, no family. Therefore, flight is a real possibility. The crime that he's been charged with is a capital offense. Accordingly, the court sets bail at $250,000. Thank you, Your Honor. Why didn't you just say 10 million or 20? There's no way. Uh, Marshal, I'd like a minute with my client. Take as much time as you want. His bail's made. Are you sure? Bail bondsman came in here before the hearing, guaranteed any amount up to a million. Damnedest thing. Hey! What do you think you're doing here? Paying your bail. Why? Kenny. There's been something I've been desperate to say to you, and, well, I, I couldn't bear to do it if you were behind bars. There's nothing, absolutely nothing that you have to say to me. Nothing. Except this. Young lady. Who? I'm his fiance, of course. Of course. We were never engaged. On the technicality that you never gave me a ring. On the technicality that I never proposed. Mr. Mason, you strike me as a fair-minded man. May I ask you a question? No. If a man says to you, I love you, I can't live without you, I want to be together forever. I never said that. Exactly. Miss Hastings, first a quarter of a million dollars bail, then physical assault, then verbal assault. I'd say you were sending Ken a mixed message. I mean, what is it I want? Mm -hmm. For public consumption, after he ran out on me, I told everyone I tossed him out and never wanted to see him again. But privately, honestly, don't tell Ken because he's already too conceited, but I'm still crazy about him. Your secret is safe with me. By the way, 
Mr. Mason. Ken may be what my grandmother used to call a cad. Lord knows he's not terribly bright. But he's not a killer. And on the romantic front, I intend to pursue you until you catch me. Just <laughs> Does she always approach life this simply? Today she was a little reserved. Meeting you, I guess. Tell me, you really ran out on her? You may have guessed her family's rich. Not rich like Wellman. We're talking generations. Money with a pedigree. That bothered you? No, I've got nothing against being rich. I'd like to be rich. And I was in love with her, was. But then she started making all these plans about what I do, what... We do. So when the scholarship to law school came along, I told her it couldn't work out. Obviously, there's no feeling left. None. None at all. I'm in love with Kimberly. Your first year here, most of your professors called you brilliant. Then all your drive seemed to disappear. You refused law review. Something must have happened. I'd like to know what that was. Lots of people are first-year wonders, then they burn out. And some make remarkable progress, like Frank Wellman. I don't know. He would never have stayed in school without help. Someone coached him, probably even wrote his papers for him, sacrificed her own career for him. How did you know? Was it that obvious? To me it was. The way you looked at him was. The first time I saw Frank, I was sitting on the law school steps, eating my lunch out of a paper sack. It was the second week of class, and he was just arriving to register because he had been in Europe on vacation. Anyway, he, uh, he got out of a sports car that cost more than a Wall Street lawyer makes in a year. The sun was behind him, and he, he almost glowed. I thought to myself, even with the top down, his hair looked perfect. <laughs> he, of course, didn't even know I existed. Until the class standings came out. He, uh, came to my study, Carol, the next day. I, uh, I spent that night in his apartment and, um... I was there three nights a week, every week after that. Yes, I knew exactly what was going on, and no, I wasn't kidding myself, but a couple of weeks ago, he told me that it was over. I knew it was coming. I mean, I knew it was inevitable, but I didn't turn out to be as tough as I thought I was. And after he rejected you, he assaulted your roommate. Yes. You told Ken deliberately, didn't you? You really wanted him to hurt Frank. Oh. Oh, it's not the way you make it sound. I mean, <laughs> I loved him. <laughs> I'm still in love with him right now. I wanted Ken to hurt him. But I never wanted him dead. You've got to believe me. I'd like to. If Ken needs me, tell him I'm at the library, okay?
Hey, Travis. Me. Where you been? Got out on bail yesterday. 250,000 bucks. You'll never guess who paid it. That girl I went out with before Kimberly? The crazy one? Well, she's still crazy. Hurry up, will ya? I just got back from the gym. Hi. Hi. Surprised you're still talking to me under the circumstances. I'm so incredibly sorry about all this. I know what you're going through. I just want you to know that I believe in you. Ken, what is it? Excuse me. I, I don't mean to interrupt. I Actually, I, I didn't hear you come in because of the shower which I was taking because the water pressure at my hotel is so awful. Isn't that typical? <sighs> Kenny, can you get me a, a towel for my hair? Because you must be Travis's new girlfriend. Travis? My roommate? Your boyfriend? <sighs> <laughs> oh, he's so gallant. <laughs> Trying to protect your sensitivity. Actually, I'm not anybody's new anything. I'm his fiance. Watch. His almost fiance. You're the girl that broke his heart. You told her that? How sweet. Amy paid my bail yesterday. Call me crazy. I beg your pardon. How'd you get in here? Travis, let me in. I told him we were very old, very dear friends. He was surprised. He said you'd never mentioned my name. I was a little hurt. Anyway, I just felt horrible after I left today because no matter how terrible you were, physical violence is never the answer. Physical violence? Her idea of a joke. I slugged him. A solid left. Of course, I was immediately overcome with remorse, so I came by today to apologize, and then I felt a little grubby, so I decided to take a shower. I should really leave. I'm sure you two have a lot to talk about. No, no, we, we don't, honestly. You're his new girlfriend. Kenny, I can't be jealous. She's lovely. Are you a law student also? That's right. And smart, too. I'd better go. <sighs> I just came by to let you know I'm here if you need me. I think that's terrific. Amy? It was very nice meeting you. What the... Ken, did you really tell her I broke your heart? I told her you were spoiled, selfish, self-centered, irresponsible... Stop! And I remember how relieved I was I didn't actually marry you. From now on, my interest in you is strictly financial. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Huh? I intend to protect my money. I'm not letting you out of my sight. The aftermath of murder can be a tedious business, Mr. McDonald. You're not an easy man to find. You make it sound like I'm trying to avoid you. That would make sense if you were the killer. Except I've got no motive. The man tried to rape your sister. I know. But you didn't tell me. How old were the two of you when your parents died? We were only three. Just out of curiosity. Who's older? I am. Twelve minutes. Guess that makes me the big brother. You're really inseparable, aren't you? Same <laughs> undergraduate college. Kimberly even came to the same law school. Yes, that's right. So you want me to believe that she didn't tell you that Wellman assaulted her? If you don't believe me, why don't you ask her? Hello, Mr. Wilson. Are you all right? Yes, it's just... I hope I'm not interrupting, but you about finished. Just winding up. Why don't you walk me out? He probably wants to ask you some questions alone. 
You're quite correct. Okay. You still think the killer was someone from our seminar? They are the only ones who knew Frank was staying in the courtroom. Mr. Mason, rather than just sitting around, would it be okay if I went back to the courtroom? Checked it out? All right, Ken, I'll arrange it, but I want you to be careful. Rack, there's uh, one other thing. It's Kimberly. Actually, it's Kimberly and Amy. You noticed. It's hard to miss. Kimberly's a terrific girl. Lord knows she's pretty. And then there's Amy. She's crazy. I mean, she can be wonderful, too. She posted my bail, and I'm grateful. But she's out of control. I never know what she's going to do next. Some people call that exciting. I know. If you're asking for my advice, I think right now you have to concentrate on the trial. You mean give them both up? I mean make a choice. And stick to it. Right. Thanks. I didn't know you were such a basketball fan. Right now, the only scouting I'm doing is for a murder suspect. <laughs> and this will be the shortest interview you ever get. I got no motive. That's not what the law firm of O'Malley and Kern would say. Listen, it's true I wanted the summer job there. That's a very prestigious firm. It's also true I was disappointed, but I got over it. Before or after you beat up Frank Willman? He told them I had a drug problem. That the reason I didn't try for the pros was I test positive. That must have made you very angry. It was a lie. All of it. I didn't try for the pros because... I didn't try for the pros because I knew I wasn't good enough. He knew that. And that big-time firm would only take one guy from our class. And even with his dad's pull, he couldn't buy his way in. Unless he got rid of me first. If you had gotten that job, it could have meant a great placement after graduation. Frank was a bastard. <laughs> Look, I'll be real honest with you. I'm not sorry Frank's dead. There's something else I'll be straight about. I didn't kill him. Here's something I'll be straight about. You're still angry enough to have killed him. Something I want to ask you. Something I want you to do. You picked a hell of a time to propose. I really appreciate you putting up my bail. It was a terrific thing to do. Why do I think the next word is but? I don't want you to leave. It's just too distracting having you around. Distracting for whom? You or Kimberly? This has nothing to do with anybody else. I'm on trial for murder. I'm in trouble. Oh. I just can't think about anything else. Come on. You don't believe me. Kenny, it doesn't matter. It's okay, I understand. Look, I love to joke around, but I am serious about one thing. Wanting what's best for you and for you to be happy. <laughs> I guess that's two things, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks. There's just one more thing. What?
can't understand what's keeping Perry. Oh, he was like that even in law school. <laughs> Nobody worked harder. What was he really like in those days? He was a grind. Nose in the book all the time. No time for anything else. Of course, it was people like him that made people like me quit the law and go into business. So. Have you ever had any regrets on that decision? I've been pretty lucky. Um, about most things, I guess. Oh, Frank, it was a terrible tragedy. We're both so very sorry. Well, hello. I want to talk to you, Perry. Uh, I'll get the uh, pretrial motions in your office. 37 years. We've been friends 37 years, and you're going to represent this boy that murdered my son? I think he's innocent. I've read the police reports. He's guilty as hell. How can you do this to me? Ken Milansky wanted me to defend him. Our relationship should have nothing to do with that. Oh. Well, why are you doing this in-depth investigation of Frank Jr.? What are you going to do, put him on trial? Well, that's a standard defense tactic, isn't it, when you don't have a case? Huh? Try the victim? Well, I'm not going to stand by while you drag my boy through the mud. I believe Ken Milansky is innocent. I'm entitled to every fact I can find. I'm entitled to search everywhere, even into your son's life. Well, I'm entitled, as an old friend, to ask you to stop. The boy's dead. I appreciate your grief. I even share it. I have no desire to make it any worse. <sighs> Disappointed in you, Perry. I'm very sorry. I have no choice. Slam the door on a man bringing you flowers, could you? They're lovely, thank you. But I have to study. Can't you take five minutes to hear an apology? Kimberly, I know how it must have looked when Amy came out of the shower the other day. Looked? Okay. Sounded like. Felt like. But it isn't. What I had with her is over. Everyone at school knows your bail was set at a quarter of a million dollars. I mean, no one would put that kind of money... I told her to leave. That was less than an hour ago. Now, what do you say? I don't know. Maybe I can take a study break. How about in an hour? What is your problem? I gotta check something out on the case. I'll be back. Hurry back. I'll be back. I'll be waiting. promised me you were leaving. I most certainly did not. I told you I wanted what was best for you. Which is obviously my help. Are you going to give me a hand up or not? 
right to the door. You're not hearing my theory? I don't even want to think about any theory you might have. It's obvious that you need me. Your brain is so fogged in from that vapid co-ed from law school, so I guess I'll just wait till you beg me to take Kenny! heard every possible phony story like I owe this man money so I've got to find him or he's my baby brother who ran away to sea and I'm searching for him so I'm gonna be completely honest with you there's this man I absolutely have to locate and he's wearing the same sweatshirt as you are lady you want information you pick up the phone and dial 411 I guess the kindest way to describe him would be sort of a badly dressed weasel mid-twenties <laughs> Around here, people savor their anonymity. What about a bribe? I know. An ugly word. However, I am willing to lay down on this bar 50... No. No, make that $100. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, then I guess I just have one more question. What are you serving for lunch? Burgers. Oh, well, I don't eat burgers. I'm a vegan. Burgers. You know what my favorite sandwich is? Fried egg. All I got is burgers. You have eggs? I can see them right there. Some guys like to put them in their beer. I realize this, this may seem just a little unorthodox, but I was just... Excuse me, what's your name? Al. Oh. Is that short for Alvin or Albert? Maybe Albert? <laughs> At any rate, could you just help me out with this? Oh, lady, you... Uh... How would it be if I made my own sandwich? Uh, I'd pay you, of course. Are you crazy? No, not seriously crazy. Just a few questions, Mr. Morgan. Fire away. Tell me, do you have your key ring on your belt? Yeah, I sure do. Every key I own's here, even the one to the moot courtroom. Never without it. You never separated from your key ring? No, sir. But you lost your keys the night of the murder, did you not? Well, yeah, he took them from me. He? Is that the only time you've been separated from your keys? Yes, sir. <laughs> so, uh, no one... No one could have made a duplicate of the key to the rear door of the building. No, it's absolutely impossible. Tell me, Mr. Morgan, where do you live? Uh, 113 Live Oak Terrace. It's a, a fancy address for a little condo building. Is that one of those buildings with a security system? Yes, sir, it's got an alarm. About two months ago, did the alarm 
go off because someone broke into your unit? Well, not exactly. But the police were called and a report was made, was it not? Yeah. Um, the city charged me $45 for a, a false alarm because I... I had to break into my own unit. Mr. Morgan, why on earth would you break into your own unit? You've told us your keys are always with you. Well, this time they weren't. I must have misplaced them. Must have misplaced them? Well, all right, I did. I lost them, but uh, I got them back. For how long were they lost? A few hours, a day, a week? A month? Well, it's not very... Long enough for someone to make a duplicate key to the rear door of the building? Objection, speculation. Sustained. Sam, we both know that if someone had a key to the rear door, that person could have entered the back of the courtroom without your knowledge. Now, isn't that true? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Redirect. No, no, Your Honor. And this court will recess for one hour. So things with Ken are really getting serious. Romance turned to passion. Passion heading towards commitment. Of course, my parents didn't approve. But I was determined, so I brought him home for Christmas. A fatal mistake. One burger, red but not cold, pickles, onions, tomatoes on the side. Anyway, so we came down to dinner the first night with my entire family poised and waiting. Hey, Amy. And then... Weasel at two o'clock. Thanks. Excuse me. I think this is my game. Yeah, says who? Says Ben Franklin. Don't be so shy. We met last night. I don't know who you are. <laughs> well, that's because you ran away. Now, who starts? I'll break. Last night when I caught you breaking into the moot courtroom... Look, I... lady, I wasn't there. Eugene, my unimpeachable sources tell me that you're in charge of the video room. Now, on the night of the murder, someone was in that room. So I went back there, and I found something. But I guess it must not belong to you. Oh, too bad. Is it my shot now? What? Uh, what, what do you think you found? I think I liked it better when you were pretending to be a tough guy, Eugene. Well, what I found was... Oh, it's not my own stick. Well, what I found, way in back of one of the files where you hid it, a pirate copy of the hottest movie out right now. Let me have it. I'll cut you in. Oh, you don't have to do that. I'll give it to you. What do you want? A few answers. Don't look so worried. The questions are not that hard. And then I get the tape? Cross my heart. When? Tonight. 8 p.m. Shay Charlotte. Until then, it's in a very safe place. Your Honor, I realize this shouldn't happen. I'm sorry. It's inexcusable calling a surprise witness. Your Honor, the district attorney has had ample time to prepare her case. Did you know this witness existed? Yes, we did. But we had no idea he had information relevant to the case. Mr. Mason? Your Honor, if this witness testifies, I'd like an adjournment immediately following that testimony. I'll need the entire weekend to prepare a cross-examination. Sounds fair to me. What could you possibly testify to? We'll soon find out. I thought it was your friend. Maybe. That's a big maybe. Where's Mr. Mason? 
Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. State your name for the record. Tra <clears throat> Travis Charles Howe. Mr. Howe, where do you reside? I share an apartment off campus with the defendant, Ken Malansky. And how long have you known the defendant? Oh, we met the first year of law school. We've been roommates the last two. I show you People's Exhibit 7, a knife previously identified as the murder weapon, and ask you if you saw it somewhere on the night of the murder. Yes, in our apartment. And how did you happen to see it? Well, I, I was in the apartment studying, and all of a sudden, Ken blew in like a hurricane. I, I, I have never seen anyone so mad. He was opening drawers and, and going through his closet, and the whole time he was yelling about... About, about what Frank had done to Kimberly. And did he find what he was looking for? Yes, in his backpack. It was the knife. What happened then? Well, he said he wanted to find Frank. What did you do? Well, uh, the whole time he was looking, I, I was trying to calm him down. When he said that about finding Frank, I tried to stop him. Then what happened? He pushed me down and told me to stay out of it. He said... He, he said he was going to get Frank, and then he left. Mr. Howe, why didn't you come forward sooner with this information? I, I'd gone to see Ken when he was in jail. He was really nervous. He, he told me to lie about the knife. He's my roommate. He, he's my friend. I thought I was doing the right thing. <laughs> Thank you. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. Pursuant to stipulation, this court is now in recess until Monday morning at 10 a.m. Mr. Howe, you're instructed to return to the stand at that time. You may step down. Court is adjourned. Never went back to the court. Mr. Mason, please control you your lying, client, perhaps? or he'll be held in contempt. Damn it, what are you trying to do to me? Get I decided to forgive you instead of leaving because I have wonderful news. I doubt it. I made a major breakthrough in the case. Amy, I've had kind of a rough day, okay? I want to hear about it. You can tell me while we're driving. All right. Have it your way. But I should tell you that we have an appointment to meet the real killer. I invited him to join us for dinner. I think someone at the law school killed Frank for a personal motive. What if it was almost like an accident? You really think it was Eugene? Well, think about it. He's up there using the tape equipment in a felonious manner, and Frank walks in on him. Things get rowdy, and Eugene nails him. With my knife? <laughs> oh. Good point. Well, we'll see. Don't you think we ought to let Mr. Mason in on our little adventure? And please, let's not bother Mr. Mason until we have something tangible. That's pretty good. The seafood's a specialty here. Is it nice? Okay. I thought you said this was a popular place. Best in town. And where is everybody? Oh, I bought out the first city. First one? Don't worry. This is a secret meeting with a murder suspect. We couldn't have a lot of people around. Here he comes.
to bring the tape? What is this, Jane? No hello? How's it going? No drink first just to be social? I believe you've met Ken. And yes, I have brought the tape. Provided you've brought some answers. We know you were in the video room the night of the murder. You're the one who ran out, weren't you? I wasn't. Can you prove that? I was with the guys that want that tape. Where is it? Not so fast, Eugene. We're not finished yet. Did you see anybody else that night? I told you I wasn't there. Now, could I have the tape? No. You're making a mistake. I don't think so. We'll see. I don't know. What do we do now? Regroup. Check, please. I'll get the car. Thank you. about the murder but take some good advice forget you ever saw me because the guys i work for are really mean they'll kill you and enjoy it are you all right i can't wait to hear your next plan come here it's all right mr howe that map of the city sets forth among other things the area around the law school. That familiar to you? Yes, sir, it is. Now, Kimberly McDonald swore that on the evening of the murder, my client left her apartment at uh, 1162 Long Ridge Road at five minutes after seven. Please mark the map accordingly. Don't forget the time. Now, where is the law school? Right here. The security officer on the scene testified he walked into the moot court at 721 and discovered Ken Malansky standing next to the body of Frank Wellman, Jr. Now, sir, when did you see Ken at your apartment? Which is where? Um, right here. I, I don't know exactly, uh, about quarter past seven. A lot, a lot of things were happening. I didn't look at my watch. That means Mr. Malansky drove from Kimberly's apartment to your apartment to the law school in 16 minutes. Now, you've lived in this town for three years. Is it really possible to do that? Well, it'd be tight, but yeah, you could do it. Now, what if Ken Malansky was driving in a reckless manner? and got pulled over by the police at Moore Park and Fourth. I'll wait for you, Mr. Howe. Please mark your map. Now, what if he got a ticket at Moore Park and Fourth? Would he still have had time for that trip? I wouldn't know. Well, I assume the ticket was written at 7.12 and the officer took five minutes to write it. How would that be possible when you say at that very moment, Ken Malansky was tearing up your apartment looking for his knife? There's no answer to your question because it's hypothetical. 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 No, Mr. Howe. Here is the ticket Mr. Melansky received at exactly 7.12. Now, uh, perhaps you'd like to review your recollection of that evening. 
The location where he got the ticket is in a direct line between Kimberly's apartment and the law school. Now, what would Ken be doing there? I don't know. He was going directly from Kimberly's to the law school. He never went home, he never searched for the knife, and you never saw him. Isn't that true, Mr. Howe? Mr. Howe. You have one last chance to reconsider your testimony. I assume you know the penalties for perjury. Um, maybe I... Maybe I'm mistaken about what happened that evening. More than mistaken, Mr. Howe. I have no further questions. At this time, Your Honor, the people request a brief recess. We'll reconvene in 15 minutes. Brilliant piece of work, Harry. Someone's trying to hang my client. Travis? He was working for somebody else? Unfortunately, neither of you could have known about the speeding ticket. What are you talking about? Would you like me to show you a letter from his bank? After you met with him four days ago, a large sum of money went into his account. Now, I want to know what the hell you thought you were doing. Harry... Ken Melansky is innocent. He's guilty. He killed my son. Frank? Getting Travis Howe to perjure himself is a crime. What are you going to do, send me to jail? I call Frank Wellman to the stand. You know, sir, that you have my deepest sympathy, but I must ask you some difficult questions. Your son did well at law school. Was that something of a surprise? No. He was a hard worker. But he did have a rather poor undergraduate record, did he not? Well, he wasn't the kind of boy who spends his Saturday nights in the library. He enjoyed people. He liked to party, drank quite a bit, was arrested many times for drunk driving, was he not? He was never convicted for driving under the influence. Never. Why not, Mr. Wellman? Mr. Wellman, why not? I spoke to friends who could understand what a thing like that would mean on his record. I took responsibility. You used your influence to get him off. You might say that. And when he broke a young man's neck in a bar fight, Mr. Wellman? I was settled out of court. Isn't it true that your son was spoiled and violent? That he never had to face up to life because you provided more? My son. My son loved me, and he would have done anything for me. I would have done anything for him as well. Your Honor, the state fails to see the relevancy of this whole line of questioning. The people will stipulate that the decedent came from a rich family, if that's what Mr. Mason is after. It is not, Your Honor. I'm exploring the character of the decedent to show that someone other than my client may have had motive. The court will allow this on the representation that counsel will connect it up.
One last question. Did you buy your son's way into law school? No, I did not. You did make several large contributions while his application was pending, did you not? One for more than a million dollars for the moot courtroom? I did what any father would have done for his son. The difference being that I had the money to do it with. No further questions, Your Honor. I thank the witness for his honesty. We'll take our lunch recess at this time. Court will be adjourned until one o'clock. Can't wait for me outside. Take that letter now. I paid for it. Yes, I believe you did. This isn't from a bank. This is a damn fundraiser for the law school. That's right, Frank. It's a hell of a way to treat a friend. Friend? Here it is, just like I promised. Good. And it's not that I don't trust you, but... No, it wasn't easy to get it, but when I make a promise to you, Answer Vic, you question. can count on me to follow through with it. Are you crazy? What the hell are you trying to do? There's some mistake. She promised me that it... Mistake? Oh, there's definitely been a mistake. My mistake. I could have got some pros to pirate for me, but no, I trust you. I even send you to video school. And why? Because you're from the neighborhood. And I like you. But that's just the kind of guy that I am. Vic, let me In a moment, true. Eugene. Is it not true There's something you have to understand. You swore to me that you could break the transfer codes and give me the three-quarter inch mask. Will you turn the damn thing off? It's giving me a headache. The three-quarter inch mask is for the guy in Rio who's going to pay me $100,000 for every master tape from that movie. And now, you're forcing me to... I know where it is. Give me one more chance. All right. You got 12 hours. And after that, we'll make a different kind of movie. A snuff film. I don't know if this was such a hot idea. If I didn't come, he wouldn't show up. No, oh, Amy, that's not what I mean. Don't you think the limo is a little overstated? You try and hail a cab in this area. Woman. I bet Ken you'd really be here. Pay up. Put it on my tab. That makes two hundred fifty thousand and five dollars I owe you. You gave me the wrong tape. Are you trying to get me killed? Those guys want to take my head off. You didn't tell us what we want to know. Tough. Give me the tape. Eugene, where are your manners? Ken, make him say please. Yeah, say please. This time I decided not to take any chances. Let's step outside. Let me give you some free legal advice. Right now, all we got on you is pirating video cassettes. Make us go someplace we don't want to go. And we're talking major felony territory. I'll take it under advisement. Now move. Last chance. This place is full of cops. Encourage her to shut up. Police! Three! Hold it!
sure. Damn you! If you weren't in the courtroom the night of the murder, who was? How do I know? Thank you, Gene! Now someone from the class must have been there. I don't know! They're getting closer. It would be a shame if you were to fall. Wait, wait. Uh, this kid paid me to show him how to use the equipment. Maybe it was him. What's his name? Oh, thank heavens you're back. Everything turned out fine. Good. Well, I can't say I approve of you two playing detective, but there's nothing like results. Well, uh, the night is still young. Is there anything else we can do? She has the limo booked for the entire evening. You should be in bed, asleep. I want him looking fresh and relaxed and innocent in the morning. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> On our way. Bye-bye. <laughs> They make a lovely couple. Yeah, I suppose. What's the matter? We're missing something. I don't know what it is, but there's something missing. If you need me for anything. Perry. Good night. Just a trifle. Dane, please rephrase your question. What happened that night, officer? Objection now, counsel is calling for a narrative. Sustained. Listen, uh, thanks for everything. What did I do? Just risk my life to save you. It was nothing, really. I'm really very grateful. That's why I did it. For a little simple gratitude. Keep looking innocent, I guess you'd better. We call Scott McDonald to the stand. Mr. McDonald, I've been looking at your record. I notice you do much better in classes where you write papers instead of taking tests for your grade. Now, why is that? Sometimes, sometimes I clutch under pressure, I guess. The paper in your hand is one on which you received an A. It's on constitutional law. Do you mind reading aloud page three, paragraph two? Yet is, it is the creation of a constitutional government structured by a deep separation of powers that significantly marks the profound conviction born of experience that, that human, human beings occupying, occupying positions, positions of leadership, leadership must, must be restrained, restrained by forces more potent than their own 
arbitrary discretion. I'm sorry you stopped, Mr. McDonald. Mr. Justice Lattimore has always been a favorite of mine. Yours too, I take it. Now, you plagiarized that paper from him, did you not? Yes. What did your sister say when she found out? She must have been very angry. Yes, she was. Frank Wellman, Jr. knew about your cheating. Isn't that so? No, no, he didn't. Did he not? The videotape of the moot court trial shows that this book of Lattimore on Frank's table wasn't needed for the trial. He had it there so you'd see it. So that you'd be constantly reminded that he could expose you. Once exposed, he'd have been thrown out of school, never to practice law, never to be law partners with your sister. That's not true. He told you to throw the trial, did he not? Kimberly and I were beating him. We were going to win. No, you were not. I was there, remember? I didn't understand why you were doing so badly. Now we know, don't we? Mr. McDonald, I was the last person to leave the courtroom on the night of the murder. And this book was there, on the table. But in the police photos of the crime scene, this book is gone. Only the killer could have taken it. Your Honor, can't you see he's badgering the witness? Young lady, please be quiet. Mr. Mason. You, uh, framed Ken Melansky, did you not? No. Mr. McDonald, this is a preliminary hearing. Let's suppose it were a full jury trial. This jury box would have 12 people in it. 12 people, all looking at you, listening to you, staring at you. 12 people sitting here, watching, and waiting for the truth. Now, Mr. McDonald, the courtroom video technician is prepared to testify that you paid him quite a lot of money to teach you how to use the equipment. Now, this videotape shows Frank Wellman Jr. rehearsing his summation in the moot court. Mr. McDonald, you were the one person capable of operating that video equipment who knew that Frank Wellman Jr. would be there that night. Now, you taped Frank Wellman doing that summation, did you not? Don't say anything, Scott. I will not tolerate your behavior, young lady. Your Honor, Miss McDonald's vocal outbursts have been a great puzzlement to me, but I think I'm no longer perplexed. It's her brother. Our witness, Scott McDonald, has to be in constant communication with his sister. He feels compelled beyond reason to see her, and if he cannot do that, he needs to hear her voice. Here is a copy of the tape. I give it to you. Mr. McDonald, it took two people to commit this crime. Your sister manipulated her roommate, Donna Lehman, making sure Ken would come to the courtroom. You made sure it would appear that Frank Wellman was still alive by playing that tape. Everyone has thought you dominated your sister. But that's not true, is it, Scott? She's the reason you're here today. She wanted revenge for the assault by Frank Wellman. And you were willing because of the blackmail. Isn't that true, Scott? Isn't it?
Listen to me, Scott. Are you going to pay for a crime you did not commit alone? No. I didn't kill him. The people move to dismiss the charges against Kenneth Malansky. Yeah. Case dismissed. Miss Prosecutor, I direct you to take all steps necessary to see to it that Scott and Kimberly McDonald are arrested for this crime. You, you ruined it. You ruined everything. You ruined it. Hey, buddy. Congratulations. Thanks, Jeff. Good job, man. Congratulations. Thanks, Paul. Take care. Yeah. Ken, I'm really sorry. Get it, Bella. Sorry. I'll see you in class. Yeah. Well, I'd like to do more. But all I can say is thank you. It's in a... Where's Amy? Well, earlier she said she was going to go pick up her $250,000 bail money and uh, leave town. That's what you've been telling her to do. Congratulations. Yeah. I guess so. You guess? She was totally irresponsible, recklessly unpredictable. And if you don't go after her this second, I'll personally see to it that you never, ever practice law. Not one word. Amy! Wait! What is it? I know. You just want to make sure that I'm absolutely leaving town. That I'm gone, out of your life forever. Well, don't worry. I I have your first-class ticket to Tahiti. Oh, it should make you overjoyed. Are you finished? Because I came down here to tell you I... <sighs> Thank you. You're welcome. Wait. And also, that... What? <laughs> what? That running away from me was the biggest mistake you ever made. And that you'll do anything. Anything to get me back. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, are you happy? Of course. It's just that a woman likes to hear these things from the man she adores. Then why are you driving away from me? Actually, this is my third time around the block. Three times? No. As always, I'll get you the first time around.
I don't know why we went for a boat ride with someone we didn't know. I just don't know. I was so paralyzed with fear that I couldn't do anything to help him. I, I just watched. Let's go. Billy, please, I can't. Sure you can. Sure you can. I'll be right there with you, just like I promised. Please, Billy. Sarah? I don't want to do this. Sarah, don't make me force you. I can't. Honey, she's dead. She's dead. It's been over 15 years. You've got to let go of it. Come on. All right. Was it around here that it happened? Okay. Now I want you to take the wheel, just like you did then. No, Billy. Come on, Sarah. No, take I it. can't. Sarah, take the wheel. what I'm doing here? All right. See that? It's up to you. You take the wheel, we're both dead. It's up to you. Celebrate. I want champagne. Lots of champagne. You wanna go, uh, you wanna go down to the city or you wanna go to the lodge? The lodge. That way we'll be closer to home after dinner and we can build the fire. In yeah. Our room. That sounds great. <gasps> oh, Billy. I've never been so happy. Oh, and they said it wouldn't last. <laughs> ah. Hey to think of it even you aren't too sure ah, i was just afraid you'd miss the limelight all those groupies on the circuit well those groupies they were kind of nice oh, <laughs> oh, they're nice no, they weren't nice they weren't nice i'm a has-been i'm an official tennis bum my groupie days are long gone you better be because i ain't ever letting go of you and a boy billy it's like you made a real woman out of her. What are you doing home so early? I thought you were at work. Oh, I'm resigning. I'm not cut out to be a mining executive. But if you and Billy swing that deal to start a ski resort, you let me know. I think that's more my speed. It could be a long time from now, Skip. Hey, I'm in no hurry. I'm not going anywhere. Yes, you are, Skip. I thought we agreed if you work for the company, you'll be paid a regular salary. You can even stay here until you can find a place of your own, but you just can't live here with us indefinitely. Is that any way to treat family? There's not that many of us left, Cousin Sarah. Lay off. I suppose I have you to thank for these new regulations, huh, Billy Boy? It's Sarah's decision. Right. It's so hard for 
for me to do that. You sure you want to do this? Positive. Okay. Hey, looks like the hooks are still on the wall. I should make it a snap. Yeah. Okay, that's got it. Okay, that looks level to me. Level to you. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Hans. You sure you're all right? just gonna take a little getting used to, that's all. How are you feeling now, Walter? Well, I suppose there's nothing like a high-priced surgeon poking around in your heart to remind you that you're mortal, just like everybody else. <laughs> oh, you're mortal, all right. That disposition of yours hasn't gotten any better since the day I got out of law school and you gave me my first job. What's with the cane? That is your fault. When I missed seeing you up here the last time, I went skiing, hence the knee and the cane. But it's going to be fine. Good. Gentlemen. <laughs> uncle Walter. I am not your uncle, young lady. I let you try my patience out of choice. Not family tie. Perry Mason, I'd like you to meet my ward, Sarah Wingate Travis. Mr. Mason, I heard you were coming to Uncle Walter's retirement party this weekend. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. I'd like you to meet my husband, Billy Travis. Yes, hello. Hello. I remember seeing you a couple of years back at Forest Hills. Did I win or did I lose? You won. Must have been an early round. Never made it past the quarterfinals there. Nice to meet you. Well, Billy's given up tennis for resort development. You look lovely tonight, Sarah. Thank you. You're a lucky man, Billy. I know. Very nice meeting you both. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can I take your cane? Yes, thank you. Dinner has already been ordered. Perry. You remember Sarah Wingate? That girl has been through a lot. For a time, most of us wondered if she'd ever recover. Indeed, there were certain people who wanted to have her institutionalized. She seems fine now, quite happy. Thanks to Billy, though everybody else around here thinks he only married her for the Wingate money. Oh, that's the first thing you ever taught me. Don't go with the crowd. Form your opinion based on fact. I haven't changed. The duck is perfect here, so I ordered fish, and that is a fact. Ah. Oh. You want another one? Yeah. Let's have another one. Yes, sir. Okay. What are we celebrating now? How about... each other? Really? Lisa, huh? Mr. Travis would like another bottle of champagne. How cover for me, huh? This one's special delivery. How are you tonight, Mr. Travis? I'm fine, thanks. And uh, so is the wine. Aren't you going to try it? I, uh, I already have. Look, why don't you just leave the bottle? I'll pour it myself. 
Sure. Should I be jealous? Of Lisa? That was a long, long time ago. You don't have to be jealous of anybody. Okay? I hope it's not too late. I've got some checks in here that need to be signed right away. Doc, can't it wait until morning? Yeah, it's government stuff. You know, if we don't get them out right away, they'll be paying some pretty stiff penalties. You know, why is it always the last minute? You're the one that's got Syracuse signing all the checks. Nothing but time and extra trouble. Well, you'll get used to it. Oh, Billy, it's all right. It's all right. Excuse me, Mr. Travis. Your brother called a few minutes ago. He'd like you to call him back. Where is he? The bar at the lodge. Excuse me, honey. I'll get in the study. How are you, sir? I've never been happier, Doug. I thought you said something about needing some signatures. Yeah. You're not gonna let him do it, are you? Do what? Sell the mine. Skip said Billy had you talked into getting out of the business altogether. You'll have to talk to Billy about that. And that'll mean new management. What happens to me? I interrupt something? Yeah. Listen, honey, I'm really sorry, but I'm gonna go on for a little while. What does Frank want this time? Nothing, really. Talk about it later, okay? Are you gonna be all right? Yeah, I'll be fine. Doug's leaving now, too. Do you want me to wait up for you? Well, it's gonna take a little while, but sure, I want you to wait up for me. Mm. I never would have gone out and left you here alone like that. Get your tea ready. That woman bartender at the lodge, Lisa Blake. What's the gossip in the village about her? Oh, I don't pay any attention to gossip. Yes, you do. What are they saying? Oh, nothing much, really. It's about her and Mr. Travis, isn't it? Now, you know it's all a lie, Sarah. Please. What are they saying about her and Billy? Well, they're saying how friendly they are. About how they're always laughing and joking together. But I was in the pharmacy yesterday, and I looked out the window and I saw Mr. Travis talking to her. And they weren't laughing or joking. They seemed, well, sort of serious and quiet. Thank you. Shall I wait up for Mr. Travis? No, that's all right, you go to bed. Good night, Sarah. Good night. So, I, uh, I'm not in the least difficult to get this Manny guy that I've been telling you about. Him. And, uh, all I need is enough to get Manny off my back for a little while. I know I can make this new deal work. I know it. Frank, it sounds great. It's just that I can't come up with that kind of money. I'm not asking you for a handout. You know me, I've never done that. 
But, uh... Look. You're my brother. I got no one else I can go to on this thing. I'm sorry, Frank. I just can't do it. All right, look, I can come up with a couple thousand cash, but you're into Manny and those gamblers for big bucks. Now, I just can't get it from Sarah again. You could if you wanted to. I put the best part of my life into teaching you how to handle yourself, showing you the ropes, managing your tennis career. Doesn't that count for anything now? No, I never told you this before, but you put the best part of your life in a shot glass. Or the poker games. Or the ponies. Frank, man, I'm, I'm sorry, but things are different now, you know? I'm married. Sarah's got to come first. I just don't know what else I can tell you. How about goodbye? <laughs> He'll be back. Frank's like me. He always comes back. What's that? Margarita. Just the way I used to make them for you in Acapulco, remember? No, thanks. I don't drink those anymore. Maybe you forgot the taste. Mm. Oh, God. Sarah? Billy, can we please just go to sleep? Okay. I love you. Looking for your sister? This is where it all happened, isn't it? I know all about it. Now it's your turn.
Sheriff, it's my wife. What happened? I don't know what happened, but she's out there somewhere. Dark, too cold, and too deep for him to find anything in that water. Isn't there anything we can do? A drag boat coming in this afternoon, but I don't expect they'll have much luck. Everybody knows this lake's reputation for not giving up its bodies. I don't think we'll ever find your wife, Mr. Travis. She's down there now, just like her sister. I got some questions for you. Like this handkerchief. These are your initials, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I also want to know how you got that blood on your pants there. I'll get it. Walter! Dalla. <laughs> Good to see you. Well, it's good to see you, too. And you. Walter, really, how do you feel? Well, I'm feeling fine, just fine. Good. Just because I've had some minor surgery, Perry thinks he should take over this case. 
Since when does a triple bypass qualify as minor surgery? They're doing them every day. They're becoming as common as, uh, as root canal. Now, Walter, you know Perry's right. You're in no condition to take over a murder case. I figured you'd be taking his side. Seriously, Della, I'm glad you're here. If Perry's going to try to fill in for me, he'll need all the help he can get. Though, so if you need me, I'll be in the intensive care ward. We'll be in touch with you. Paul's downstairs checking us in. Did you call Billy Travis yet? I wanted to get all the background I could from Walter. How does it look? Uh, what about Billy? Could be better. A lot better. Good morning. Nice place. Should have brought my ski stuff. They already got snow on the higher elevations. Paul, you might not have time to go skiing for a while. Why's that? This ought to be simple. First thing you have to do is call an old schoolmate friend of yours who lives near here. She says if you leave town without seeing her, she'll never forgive you. Then you can start checking these names. Skip Wingate, Douglas Vickers, Mrs. Constance Cheney, Frank Travis. Are, are they suspects? According to Walter, all of them had motive. All of them knew that Sarah was in the habit of going to the lake when she was troubled. All right, let's go talk to Billy. Perry, Walter is convinced that Billy couldn't have done it, isn't he? He is, as am I. For a moment there, she looked familiar. For a moment there, she was. Paul? Yeah. Mush. Did you recognize the caller's voice? No, I was still half asleep. I can't even tell you if it was a man or a woman. All I know is that they whispered words. You'll find Sarah in the lake. So you went to the lake? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know what to think. When I got there, I found her car was empty and her... her shoe and her scarf floating in the water. I didn't know. I... I didn't know. I thought maybe she... Suicide? Yeah. But the sheriff got there just in time to see you rowing to shore, alone. But he also received an anonymous phone call from someone who was whispering. Look, I could never have hurt Sarah. Never. But somebody sure went out of their way to make it look like I did. Somebody, Billy. Now we're going to find that somebody. Division two of the Superior Court of Buckner County is now in session. The Honorable Howard J. McGraw presiding. Be seated and come to order. Does the defendant want a formal reading of the complaint, Mr. Mason? My client will waive a formal reading, Your Honor. Mr. Reston? That's fine with me, Your Honor. Very well, gentlemen. I'll set this for uh, Thursday the 21st. Do you have a bail motion, Mr. Mason? Why, yes, Your Honor. We, uh... Yes, it, Your Honor. The defendant has only lived in this jurisdiction for a number of months, and he has no ties sufficient to ensure his making his next court appearance. Mr. Mason? Your Honor, the prosecutor has accused my client of murdering his wife in order to acquire her rather substantial fortune. 
Using his own argument, it's not reasonable to assume that Billy Travis would now run away, thereby proving his guilt and throwing away millions of dollars. I'll set bail at $300,000, Mr. Mason. You can take care of the arrangements with my clerk. We're in recess. All rise. I've uh, seen the evidence, Mr. Mason. You've drawn a losing card, I think. Game's not over yet, counsel. Not yet. Harry. Yeah, I'm so glad I caught you. Here's the background material you wanted. Oh, Billy, this is Della Street. She runs my office. It's a pleasure to meet you. Billy Travis, Perry and I have watched you play many times. I'm just going to take Billy home. I'm not sure when I'll get back. Why don't you and Paul dig up what you can on the old kidnapping case? The old case? You think there's a connection between Sarah's disappearance and Amy's disappearance? I'm not quite sure what I think, but I am intrigued by the coincidence. We'll see you. Oh, you know Paul. As soon as I have a chance, I want to get in touch with Vi. Who's Vi? Vi Densler, my old school chum. Oh, 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 that Vi, yes. Remember, I always wanted you to meet her daughter, the librarian. Librarian? How exciting. <laughs> Stupid. Hey, look, this is empty. Better get some beers. Don't go away. Oh, look who's back. I was jail. How can you be partying at a time like this? Man, how can you show your face after what you did? You must be Mr. Wingate. My name's Mason. <laughs> oh, yeah. I heard you took the case from old man Hazlitt. I can't understand why. I'd be happy to explain it, if you have the time. I'm sorry. As you can see, I'm uh, wrapped up. This is Mr. Mason. He'd like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. Yes, what is it? The morning Mrs. Travis drove to the lake, did you see or hear any other cars around the property? No. But you did hear Mrs. Travis' car leaving? No. But the garage is right there. Surely the sound of a car Mrs. started... Mrs. Travis came back from the village that night and left the car out in front. I'm sorry, Mr. Travis. I was already in bed. I didn't go out to put it away. Hans. Yes? Your phone is ringing. This is Hans. Has he been there yet? Yes, and asking questions. Well, there's nothing to worry about. I'll handle him. You just stay in your room. If anybody asks about me, you know nothing. Nothing, you understand? Sorry to intrude, Mrs. Cheney. I'm... You're Perry Mason, of course. So, what can I do for you? I understand you manage all the affairs pertaining to the estate. You pay the help, order the groceries. Yes. For the last ten years, ever since Mr. Wingate died. And Billy quoted Sarah as saying you've been in charge of everything since she and Amy were little girls. Well, little girls tend to exaggerate. Sarah said that just two weeks ago. What's your point, Mr. Mason? Well, Sarah recently took over those duties, didn't she? Mr. Mason... I've been with this family for 25 years. I raised those two little girls. They're the children I never had. Suddenly, I was no longer needed. Sarah didn't need me anymore. That was after she married Mr. Travis? Yes. Everything changed after he moved in with us. 
Those the financial records of the household accounts? Yes, just general maintenance, repairs, utilities, that sort of thing. I've been trying my best to make some sense out of it since Sarah... If you need help, you can call on me, Mrs. Cheney. There's going to be a general audit, you understand. Yes, of course. And now you'll have to excuse me, Mr. Mason. I have to see about dinner. Mr. Mason, did you find anything? Well, we made a start. Did you get in touch with your brother, Frank? No, and I'm worried about him. You know, he's vanished before, but he's always stayed in touch with me. He owes a lot of money to people from Las Vegas. All right, Billy. We'll try to find him. Hopefully before they do. Hopefully before they do. No. Because I'm the one doing all the dirty work, taking all the chances, not you. Yeah? Yeah, well, that's how I'm playing it. And if you don't hold up your end, I may just have a few more surprises for you. Why should I tell you where I am? Yeah, that's right. I don't trust you. And if you try anything, I just may come after you, too. Keep you waiting so long, but it couldn't be avoided. Isn't this unusual, working the mine these long hours? It is, but we're fighting for our lives here. Now, Billy Travis had it his way. He'd shut this mine down. Is that bad? Sure. New owners would lay men off or go non-union. And replace you. Mr. Mason, if Billy Travis gets away with this, a lot of people are going to be upset. I take it you don't approve of Billy Travis under any circumstances. They were just playing Sarah for a fool. Once she caught him at it, he killed her. But you're no fool, are you? Your becoming president of this company is quite a success story. I feel very fortunate that Mr. Wingate took a liking to me. He must have liked you a great deal. There's no secret he gave me my first big promotion out of gratitude. Gratitude? Well, I was one of the sheriff's posse that caught up with little Amy's kidnapper at Indian Peak. As a reward, he upped me to foreman. Seemed to take a personal interest in me. Started inviting me up to the house. The day he died was the saddest day of my life. I understand you also spent a good bit of time with Sarah. The girl was lonely, afraid her father was gone. I felt sorry for her. That why you proposed to her? Who told you that? Proposed not once, but three times? That's nonsense. Who said that? Sarah told Billy. Billy! <laughs> Billy! You see, there you are. You know, I don't know why you come around here asking me questions when the man who murdered her is your own client. I got work to do. Mr. Vickers, is it true that before Billy came on the scene, you approached Walter Hazlitt with the idea of having Sarah committed? Yeah, you better watch your step on the way out, Mason. People have been known to take bad falls around here. I wouldn't worry about Frank Travis, Drake. Gamblers have a way of showing up, either in a jail cell, a hospital bed, or a steel drawer in the morgue. I figure we'll find him one of those places sooner or later. Did you have a chance to look at the motels around here? First thing we did. Both up in the village and down here in town. If he's still around. He's hiding under a rock someplace. All right, well, thank you very much for your time, Sheriff. Appreciate it. Drake, one more thing. I suppose you get used to playing pretty fast and loose working for an important lawyer like Perry Mason. You get a line on Frank Travis, I want to know right away. He'll be the first to know. Thank you. Excuse me. You working? Well, it depends on where you want me to go. Well, you have to tell me. I got a couple hours to kill, and I'm looking for a place I can get a good steak, a decent drink, and maybe lay down a bed or two. 
Sorry, pal. There's no place like that in this town. Sure? Not if you want all three, but if you don't mind lousy food and weak drinks, I know where you can lay down a bed on anything that runs, kicks, hits, or dribbles. Last place lounge. Well, I'll check it out. Uh, here, thanks for the tip. Let's talk again, huh? Hi. Hi. Bye. Bye. What's this? Copies of newspaper clippings on the kidnapping case. These all you could find? Well, that's all there was in the village library. But tomorrow I'm going to go in and check the city's newspaper morgue. Good idea. The papers around here should have been full of this case. It's a long time ago. It is quite a story, though, isn't it? Missing body cases are like that. They never seem to go away. Did, uh, did they ever catch the kidnapper? He was killed in a gun battle. Oh. Well, Perry, I have this theory. If the kidnapper were still alive, maybe he had something to do with Sarah's murder. I don't think I believe that history repeats itself. But I do believe that sometimes people try to repeat history. What if he didn't work alone? What if he had help? An accomplice? Mm -hmm. Maybe the accomplice planned all this. It's an interesting thought. By the way, did we hear from Walter this afternoon? No, there were no messages. Please call and ask him for a copy of Sarah's will. I want to see you how the estate... You want to see how the estate will be divided. Why, yes. What? That guy. He's watching you. Who? Him. Is that Manny the guy who's after you? No. Haven't you got something you gotta go do? Frank, I just got here. Go you... fix your face, okay? Oh, okay. It's a good idea, Frank. <laughs> Listen, uh, listen, I know that Manny is really mad, okay? Just just give me a chance to explain, okay? Well, I'm not going anywhere. I, I just need a little more time, that's all. Everybody knows I'm good for my marker, huh? And Manny's gonna get every cent that I owe him. I mean Frank, it. Frank, Frank, you don't want to call on a con, man. Now, where are you gonna come up with that kind of money? Not me, my brother. <laughs> my brother has got a lock on millions. Now, I heard... That your brother was going to be doing time for a murder rap. No, 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 no way. No, no. They'll never convict him without a body. And they're never going to find a body, believe me. Did you know something? Hey, man. Well, why don't you tell me so I can explain it to Manning? Hmm. Sure, sure. Hey, but not here. Um, hey, why don't I buy you dinner? Huh? What about your girlfriend? <laughs> that airhead? <laughs> I was gonna shake her anyway. How about Chinese? You like Chinese? I know a place that's got primo Chinese. I like Chinese. No tricks. <laughs> well, I promise, okay? Look, uh, I'm gonna tell you something. I'm tired. I've been running and hiding, and I'm tired. I, I, in a way, I'm glad you caught up with me. In a way, I'm glad I caught up with it, too. Come on, let's go. Yeah. What are you doing? I'm saving you, Frank. From what? I had to 
guy eating out of my hand. see mrs travis when she came back here that night yep i was right behind her when she came in and caught her husband and lisa in the middle of a kiss had billy come here to meet with miss blake no he'd been talking with his brother frank seems that they had some sort of argument and frank got all mad and rushed out next thing i saw was lisa planning a big one on mr travis what you're saying is it was miss blake who kissed billy it sure is the way it looked to me I'd like to talk to her. What time does she come to work? She doesn't. Not anymore. Since when? She called in about 11 o'clock the next day. Said her mother was sick and she was going home to take care of her. Now, was there a particular man in Miss Blake's life? Come to think of it, no. Lisa liked to work all the fellas that came in here. A lot of them tried to date her, but I never saw her go out with any of them. I always had the impression, though, that there was somebody she was seeing. Thank you for your time. If you should hear from her, I'd appreciate your letting me know. Sure thing, Mr. Mason. Thanks. You miss it? You know, sometimes I play old matches over and over again in my head when I'm sleeping. Guess it'll always be a part of me. Have you given up playing? That too. Two operations on the shoulder. It was worse than when I first wrecked it. I'm sorry to hear that. Dylan said you were looking for me. Mr. Mason, I got a call from Frank this morning. Well, did he say where he was? No, he wouldn't tell me. All I could get from him was that some leg breaker from Las Vegas almost caught up with him last night. This guy must have scared Frank pretty bad. He said he was going to get lost for a little while. Did Frank ever spend any time with Lisa Blake? Frank and Lisa? Why? What are you thinking? Well, she seems to have left town just about the time Frank dropped out of sight. How long has Frank known Lisa? We both met Lisa in Acapulco when I was there for a tournament. It was uh, five or six years ago. She'd show up around the circuit every now and then after that. But I always figured it was me she came to see on Frank. All right, what about you and Lisa? Now, wait a minute, Mr. Mason. I gave up Lisa and that whole world when I met Sarah. As far as I was concerned, Sarah and I As far as I was concerned, Sarah and I were going to be married forever. I got to get going. Billy. Well, hello. 
Oh, hi, Paul. Where are you off to? A quick lunch with Bye and her daughter, and then back to the court. Oh, library. Della, big mistake. You probably don't really want to see her, and she probably doesn't want to see you. Paul, that's ridiculous. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, here's a receipt for some car repairs I wound up with after last night. What repairs? Oh, hi, Perry. Just, uh, it's a little bill for four tires. Four tires? <clears throat> and a bumper. Perry, you're not going to believe this, but I caught up with Frank Travis last night. But? But, uh, I had a little accident and he got away. But I almost had him. I thought some leg breaker from Las Vegas almost had him. How'd you hear about that? Forget how I heard about that. Right now, it's more important that you find Elisa Blake. She was a bartender here at the lodge. How long has she been gone? She called in Tuesday morning about 11 with a lie about having to leave town. I'll be in touch. Mm -hmm. Tell him I'd like you to run a check on Lisa Blake. See what you can find out about her. Well, if it's all right, uh, could I do it right after lunch? Sure. Good. In fact, why don't you come along? I'm sure Vi would love to meet oh, you. Oh, I'm afraid she's not coming, Della. She left a message at the desk saying she'd explain everything later. I guess Paul was right. She really doesn't want to see me. That's not possible. It's not? Who wouldn't want to see you? Oh, oh, oh. Hello there. Can I help you? Well, I certainly hope so, Mrs. Niff. Oh, call me Polly. <laughs> Polly. I bet you're with that Mr. Mason down at the lodge, aren't you? How do you know that? You must be Paul Drake, right? <laughs> you got it. You've heard of small town gossip? Well, we're no different here than any place else. <laughs> there, well, I feel good about coming in then. Why don't you stop soft soaping me, Paul, and tell me what it is you need. All right. I am trying to trace a call that came into the bar over at the lodge about ten days ago. There's no way we can do that. Mm, I was afraid you were going to say that. What are you looking for? I'm trying to get a line on Lisa Blake. All the men around here say she makes mean martini. All the women would like to swizzle her with a stick. <laughs> swizzle her with a stick, okay? Wait a minute. When did you say that call came in? A week ago Tuesday. What time on Tuesday? 11 a.m. I think you should try the town of Oakwood. What makes you say that? Well, the operator over there is a phone friend of mine. You know, we talk sometimes. But anyway, that Tuesday morning, she called trying to track down who it was that run out on $4.57 worth of overtime charges. It could have been Lisa Blake. All right. Thank you very much. You are terrific. Of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> so you think he did it? Who? Billy Travis. You think he killed Sarah? Well, you know, I'm not allowed to comment on a case that I'm working on. Well, you don't have to, because I think he's as guilty as he can be. He killed her for the money and then tried to make it seem like she'd had an accident or committed suicide. Well, you may be right. Of course I'm right. I'm a good judge of men. I've been married four times. <laughs> <laughs> Is that all? Okay, thanks a lot. The operator's name is Loretta. I'll call and tell her you're coming. Okay, thank you very much. Lisa Blake, take a look at the second page. Two years for assault with intent to commit murder. Don't get in touch with the prison officials, her parole officer. Any friends she had at the time, we could connect with one I've of I've already them. started on it. I really 
thought Frank would show up for this. Why didn't he? You're still thinking he's involved in this with Lisa. All rise. Division two of the Superior Court of Buckner County is now in session. Hey there. You own this place? That's right. You want to buy it? Make you a good price. Oh, well, I have to think about that. It's lovely, though. Pretty view. Bet you see about everything that goes on up here, don't you? Yeah, what little there is. Say, you wouldn't happen to be from the highway department uh, about the new interstate, would you? No, actually, I'm a, a representative for the phone company. See this booth over here? We're losing a lot of money on it, and I'm trying to find out who's responsible. Lots of people use that phone. Well, I'm looking for someone in particular. Made a phone call about a week ago Tuesday, about 11 a.m. Hard to say. Well, you wouldn't be able to miss this person. Pretty girl, about five foot six. Wild red hair, drives a beat-up land cruiser, I believe. Yeah, hey, I think I know the one you mean. Not exactly the type you find hanging around an oil spot in a road like this. She's still around here? Well, at least she was a couple hours ago. Came in and bought a few things. Huh. Is she alone? Yes. But I've been noticing she's buying two of most things, you know, TV dinners. Wouldn't have to know where I could find her, would you? No, I'd try one of those places down the highway if I was you. Uh, there's three or four of them. All right. I'll do that. Thank you very much Ever for your time. Ever in the market for a grocery store, let me know. Could be a lot of action around here once the new interstate comes through. I'll keep that in mind. Now, Sheriff, I show you People's Exhibit Number 5, Man's Handkerchief. Have you seen it before? Yes, sir. One of my deputies found it hidden under a pile of leaves just back of where the defendant was parked at the lake. Were you able to establish ownership of this handkerchief? I was. There's a monogram on it with the defendant's initials. We traced it to the store in the village where he bought it. Your Honor, for the record, this handkerchief is covered with dried blood stains. The record will so reflect, Mr. Rest. Thank you. Sheriff, were you able to determine the source of the blood stains? Yes, sir. Laboratory analysis showed it to be human blood type B negative. The same blood type as the victim, Sarah Travis. That's correct. Thank you. Sheriff, could you identify for me, please, for the record, people's exhibits numbers six and seven? And number six is a scarf belonging to the victim that was found in the defendant's possession the morning his wife disappeared. The bloodstains on this scarf, are they similar to those on the handkerchief? They are. And People's Exhibit 7, this pair of pants worn by the defendant on that morning. The bloodstains on this pair of pants, are they similar to the stains on the scarf and the handkerchief? They are. Thank you, Sheriff. For the record, I show you People's 8. Can you identify it? It's a woman's shoe. We found it in the rowboat just after the defendant had rowed ashore. And were you able to determine who it belongs to? Yes, sir. It's the left shoe of a pair specially ordered for the victim by a store in the village. Thank you, Sheriff. No further questions. That's all true. Their truth, Billy. But we also have your truth. Sheriff Prine. You watched Mr. Travis as he rode back to shore, did you not? Yes, sir. Could you describe for us his style or uh, manner of rowing? Well, I'd kind of call it uh, kind of crab-like. Crab-like? Meaning what? Well, as I recollect, he was rowing mostly with one arm, the, the left one, I believe, uh, while with his right, he was sort of stabbing at the water. Far from being rhythmic or smooth, his technique was unusual, to say the least. Yes, it was. Thank you, Sheriff Prine. No further questions. She's pretty strange when all right. Barely comes out at all during the day, and she won't let my wife go near the place to clean it up. She's number 10 there. I'm about ready to throw her out. She's way behind the rent. Is she alone? She's got some fella in there with her. Wouldn't happen to be Frank Travis, would it? I don't know. I don't ask too many questions. 
What's he look like? I really never did get a good look at him. A couple of times I did see anything. All I caught was the back of his brown leather jacket. Thank you. What you done? You run her off, and I'm out a whole week's rent. And I had just started to scan the valley with my binoculars when I saw a small boat heading out onto the lake. Could you see who was in that boat? No, sir. I was too far away for that. But I could see that the person rowing was in a hurry. And the other person? Seemed to be lying back in the boat. About what time was this? Maybe 5.45, 5.50, no later. That's roughly half an hour before the phone call that Mr. Travis claims to have received. Objection. Argumentative. Sustained. Anything else, Mr. Reston? No, nothing further, Your Honor. Your witness, Mr. Mason. You just testified that you saw someone rowing, but you couldn't see who it was. Isn't that correct? That's right. I was too far away. And that person appeared to be in a hurry. Yes, that's right. And the rower's style. Could you see whether it was smooth, even, choppy? Objection. Your Honor, so far the relevancy of this line of questioning has eluded counsel for the people. <laughs> Overruled for now. But let's keep it moving, Mr. Mason. You may answer, sir. Yes, there was a smoothness and rhythm to the movement I saw. Thank you. Nothing further. You may step down. With the court's indulgence, a defense witness is in the hallway. And because of his surgical schedule, he's only able to testify today. I ask that he be permitted to testify out of order, Your Honor. Mr. Reston? People are always interested in variety, Your Honor. No objection. Call your witness, Mr. Mason. What is your present position, Dr. Everett? I am Chief of Orthopedic Surgery at Valley Central Hospital. The defendant, Mr. Travis, is a patient of yours, is he not? He is. Doctor, please tell us when you first saw Mr. Travis and why you saw him. Approximately three years ago, he came to me for treatment of a severely damaged rotator cuff. That injury nearly ended his tennis career, did it not? Absolutely. His shoulder is one of the worst I've ever seen. After several therapies, two surgeries, we could see no improvement whatsoever. And his condition for the past, say, six months? A substantial nerve damage, deterioration. Uh, his range of motion in his right arm is less than 30%. And... Your experience as an orthopedist, and with your knowledge of the condition of Mr. Travis' right shoulder, do you have an opinion on his ability to have smoothly and forcefully rowed a small boat during the past six months, or at the time of this alleged murder? Yes, I do. What is that opinion? He could not. Absolutely not? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Thank you, Doctor. That's all. Yes, I can call in and let you know where I am more often. Right now, I'm down in Oakwood. Perry, you're not going to believe this, but I caught up with Lisa Blake. And the car? I don't think you'd call it damage. I just lost the distributor cap, but I'm having a new one sent over. What else? Lisa's been checked into a motel here since the day of Sarah's death. And there seems to be someone with her. A guy in a brown leather jacket. And that is who? I don't know. I'm guessing it's Frank Travis, but I'm not sure now. Why not? Perry, I found a hairbrush they left behind in the room. It's engraved with the name Amy Wingate. The same Amy who's been dead for 15 years. 
Paul, go back to the motel before they clean that room. We need a complete forensic examination. You got it. Mrs. Cheney said you want to see me, Mr. Mason? What's it about? Lisa Blake. You and Lisa Blake. Me? <laughs> you got the wrong guy. Sure, I noticed her, but I uh, haven't had time to get around to her yet. Is that right? You have quite a reputation as a ladies' man. You know, you're wasting your time. Everybody knows Billy married my cousin for her money. And he's the only one that has anything going on with Lisa. Now he's going to be convicted of murder. Which would agree with you mightily, wouldn't it? Is there a law against that? There is a law against murder. <laughs> you don't seriously believe that I did it, do you? You had motive. If Billy were to be convicted, you stand to inherit the lion's share of Sarah's estate. What about Mrs. Cheney? What about you, Mr. Wingate? Forget it, Mason. I was nowhere near the lake that morning. And I have companions who will swear to it. If Lisa Blake was your accomplice, you could have been on another planet. This little talk is over. Why don't you just get out of here? Just get out! Excuse me. Is there a problem here, Mr. Mason? No, no, no. Mr. Wingate was just bidding me good night. Good night. On that Tuesday, the morning of the 12th, the morning that Sarah Travis disappeared, were you at the Wingate house? Yes. With the exception of days off, I've been there every day for nearly a quarter of a century. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Mrs. Cheney. Uh, at what time in the morning do you normally rise? 6.30 sharp. I have an alarm clock, but I never need it. Is there a phone in your room? Of course there is. At around 6.15 that morning, Mr. Travis claims that he received an anonymous telephone call. Did you hear the phone ring that morning? I did not. Did you hear the phone ring at any time between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. that morning? I did not. I'm a very light sleeper, Mr. Reston. If the phone had rung, I would have heard it. I'm positive it didn't ring. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Cheney. No further questions. Mrs. Cheney, is the telephone in your bedroom an extension of the estate's main phone line? It is. Are there any telephones just for intercommunication on the estate, not connected to that main number? I really don't know. Oh, Mrs. Cheney, you manage the estate, you pay the phone bills, don't you? Yes, but I could hardly be expected to remember every detail. Mrs. Cheney, is there a telephone in the caretaker's room? I believe so, yes. But it's an intercom line only, isn't it? There's no outside line. Objection, Your Honor. There is no foundation for this question, and even if there is, it wouldn't be relevant. I want to see where Mr. Mason's going with this. Proceed. You weren't in your own room that morning. Were you, Mrs. Cheney? Well, of course I was. Isn't it true that you have an established pattern in your life? You leave your room at night after everyone's asleep? Leave my... Well, certainly not. Isn't it true that having left your room, you spend the remainder of the night in the caretaker's room? Order. Order. No. Isn't it true that you could not have heard the phone ring? 
because the phone in Mr. Bruck's room is not connected to the outside line. Order. Order. All right. I was there. And I couldn't have heard the phone ring. If it rang. to call me hours ago. Where was he when you last heard from him? Well, he was headed north. All rise. <laughs> Continuing with the people versus Travis. Be seated. Uh, Your Honor, due to a pressing problem with an associate of mine, I'd like to request a recess until tomorrow. Mr. Reston? Uh, the prosecution has no objection, Your Honor. Court will adjourn till 9 a.m. tomorrow. He was headed north out of Fairview. But, Perry, that was at the crack of dawn. I'm on my way. It's odd. Is he all right? I don't know. Go a little slower, will you please? The man at the gas station was positive Paul took this road. Hold it. Get help. I'm all right. They want you here overnight just as a precaution. Perry, I was that close. Um. There's no sign of any concussion. Thank you, Doctor. Morning. You're free to go at any time. Thanks, Doc. See? Told you, all I needed was a good night's sleep, a hot shower, and I am ready to go find Lisa. I certainly hope you find her. Well, when I left the road yesterday, she was screaming up Route 118. You know where 118 goes? It dead ends up in the foothills. I have a very strong suspicion that Lisa is hiding out up there. 
I'd like to go with you, but I have to be back in court at nine this morning. All I need's a car. Take mine. How are you going to get back? Oh, I'll figure something out. You better get back faster if you're going to make it by nine. I got the forensic report on the items you found in the motel room. Let me tell you something. You better get back fast. Can't be too many places they'd be staying. Just a couple of line shacks. Old burned out cabin all that's up there. All right. Thanks for your time. what you're looking for what do you want i brought you a gift subpoena i'm not even gonna give you a lift to court it's over it's over it's over come on let's go talk to your friend Now 9.45 a.m. and defense counsel has made no effort to even contact the court, nor is his associate, Ms. Street, able to suggest why the court's time is being wasted in this matter. given up on you. I did that years ago. I beg the court's pardon for my tardiness, but hope to show why it couldn't be helped. I'm sure we're all very curious to learn why it couldn't be helped, Mr. Mason. You may proceed. After you.
I call Skip Wingate. Wingate, how old were you when your cousin Amy disappeared in the lake? I was about 19. You informed the authorities that the kidnapper, James Maisley, had been lurking around the estate earlier, isn't that right? Yes, I guess so. <clears throat> in one of the first newspaper stories, you're quoted as saying there were two men that Maisley had an accomplice. Come on, it was a long time ago. Would you like to look at that to refresh your memory? No. No, I... I was just confused. In all the excitement, I thought there were two guys. I was wrong. You're positive of that now, even retrospectively. Yeah, I'm positive. Your Honor, I object. I fail to see any hint of relevance in the past crime to the one before us now. Your Honor... Counsel has stated precisely the point I intend to make. That it's not mere coincidence that Sarah Travis disappeared in the same waters as her twin sister. That there is indeed a strong connective link between the past crime and this one. Overruled. I'd like to see if Mr. Mason can really make such a connection. Mr. Wingate, you were enrolled as a sophomore in the Colorado School of Mines at time of the attempted kidnapping. That's right, but I left. Would you please tell the court why? I was, um, upset over what happened to Amy. Isn't it true that you dropped out of school because you were failing virtually every single one of your classes? I intended to go back and make up those grades. I just never got around to it. You never got around to it because you went to work for your uncle's mining company yes i got a good job but not from your uncle isn't that so all right yes let's see you were 20 years old you had virtually no experience you failed all of those training classes Yet someone hired you as a research and development consultant. I was hired to do the best I could, and I did. The real truth is that there was no job. What are you talking about? Weren't you, in fact, being paid for your silence about the kidnapper's connection with someone at Epic Mining? No, no. Isn't it true that you withheld information at the time of Amy Wingate's death? Well, isn't it? Mr. Wingate, I direct you to answer, or I'll hold you in contempt of court. I had nothing to do with what happened to Sarah. That does not answer the question. It was 15 years ago. I don't remember. Don't be ridiculous, Mr. Wingate. You have a marvelous memory. Now, who wanted their connection with the kidnapper kept quiet? Who? Vickers. Doug Vickers. Order. Order in this court. Thank you. I call Douglas Vickers. Mr. Vickers, you authorized those payments to Mr. Wingate, did you not? I did, but not for the reason you're inferring. It was good politics for me to give the kid a job. He flunked out of school. His uncle didn't know what to do with him, so uh, I gave him a job. Didn't Mr. Wingate see you with the kidnapper, James Maisley, on more than one occasion? All right, I, I knew Maisley. He kept hounding me for a job at the mine, but that's as far as my relationship went with him. A relationship you kept hidden by paying off Mr. Wingate. You blame me? I needed the job. Tying me to Maisley would have meant my being fired. Or worse. I had nothing to do with the kidnapping. Mr. Vickers, you were a reserve deputy sheriff at the time, isn't that correct? Yes. And when the hunt was on for Maisley, you joined the posse. 
It was my duty. You, in fact, were one of three men who tracked Maisley down to where he was hiding in the mountains. That's correct. When Maisley was cornered, did he make any effort to surrender? Not that I could see. Apparently, there were different accounts of what happened that day, the day Mr. Maisley was shot. Do you remember the other two men who were with you? Look, Mason, I know what they said, and I know what I saw. I went through all of this with the sheriff and was cleared. So James Maisley was silenced and never lived to reveal the name of any accomplice he might have had. Your Honor, the court knows I have been patient, but I see no reason that this clearly irrelevant line of questioning should continue. I agree. The court is sustaining the objection. Let's move on, Mr. Mason. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, may I have a moment? Very well. Mr. Vickers, as president of the Epic Mining Company, to what would you attribute the company's declining fortunes? A number of uh, economic factors. We're no different from any other mine in the state. Business is just plain bad. Bad? Does the word bad accurately describe large financial discrepancies and misappropriation of company funds? I don't know what you're talking about. The accounting firm of Harriman and Greenleaf would know, wouldn't they? They were the firm hired by Sarah Travis to prepare a financial statement for the company's possible sale. I haven't seen the statement. I'm sure you will in due time. As would the mine's owner, Sarah Travis, if she were here today. Her intention was to sell the mine, wasn't it? There was some talk. That would have meant an examination of the company records. It would have meant losing your job. You didn't want that to happen, did you, Mr. Vickers? You're saying I had reason to kill Sarah? That's exactly what I'm saying. And if you did kill her, you had an accomplice, Lisa Blake. I don't know anyone by that name. Isn't it true Billy Travis arranged a job interview at your office last October for Lisa Blake? Mr. Mason, I interview a lot of people. Maybe, but this one was a little different. Mr. Vickers, didn't you arrange for her to get a job at the lodge? No. Isn't it true that you and Lisa plotted to murder Sarah Travis and frame her husband because they intended to close down the mine? That's not true. Isn't it true that on the night before her disappearance, Sarah and Billy Travis had a quarrel brought on by the actions of Lisa Blake? I wouldn't know. Isn't it true you then instructed Lisa to lay in wait for Sarah Travis all night if necessary? No. Isn't it true that Lisa was to murder Sarah and dump her body in the lake to foster the romantic notion that history was repeating itself? I tell you, no. Order. Order! Order! Mr. Vickers, isn't it true that Lisa Blake failed to carry out your instructions because of greed? She wanted more money from you, and finally she had to change the plan. Finally, she had to change your plan. You can't prove a word of this. I think I can. Sarah. What about me, Vickers? You got me into this. Sarah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for yes, anything. Yes, you th did. You wanted Sarah Travis dead. Shut up. You wanted me to kill her. I didn't do that. Shut up. Get her out of here. Sarah, get her out of here. Let me go. 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 I believe the Honorable District Attorney should end this by moving for a dismissal of all the charges against Mr. Travis. Uh, that motion, Mr. Prosecutor, is granted. 
The defendant is ordered released herewith. Case dismissed. Thank you. We're so glad you're all right. Look who's here. Bye. Oh, it's been so long. <laughs> Paul, I'd like for you to meet my good friend, Vi Denslow. Hello. How do you do? And this is her daughter, Melissa. Can we have dinner tonight? I'd love it. I'll call you as soon as I get back from taking Melissa to the airport. Airport? Back to work in Boston. Boston? Mm -hmm. I'll call. I'll call, too. Well, I guess that just leaves us. <laughs> what would be nice? Oh, oh, I almost forgot. The ski lodge will be open in a couple months. You're invited. Ah, ski. <laughs> oh, no. Perry's given up skiing. the jet around seven. Where are you going? New York. Is there anything I can help you with? I don't think so. Okay, who's up first? You're seeing Spencer and his attorney at two o'clock, then Kathy Grant and her attorney. I hope we can avoid any more lawsuits. It's a public relations nightmare. Yeah, I just hope I can get some of my money back from that one. Well, leave him alone. Brown! Hey, Brown! Up here! Take it easy on him, okay? As if he were my own son. Want to bet he doesn't make it up the stairs? You're lazy, Brown. Your days are numbered, kid. Yes, sir. How you doing, Brown? Feeling okay? Never better. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear it. A couple of these expansion teams have been calling about you. you. Got some crazy idea that I might want to trade you just because you blew a few games for us. Hey, anybody can have a slump. Excuse me, I, I'm sorry. Uh, what'd you say? I said anybody can have a slump. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. And I told him, just watch how well he's going to play for the rest of the season. So if you hear any rumors about being traded, don't believe it. You're part of the family. Uh, yeah, like you, I suppose, huh? Well, let me tell you something, kid. It's about time you learn how to handle people, okay? That's subtle enough for you? You know, Spencer could become a real problem unless we can come up with a settlement. Why are you so worried about this hockey player? Probably one of the most popular stars we ever had, that's all. Eh, all fans think that professional athletes are greedy and overpaid, but they also have a short memory. Well, Spencer doesn't. He remembers all the promises you made. He's got nothing on paper. All he's got is a bad temper. No, I was with you when you told Spencer you'd take care of him. Now, that's very interesting. Read my lips, because I'm only going to say it once. I was alone. Get it? Kathy! Ah, <laughs> oh, you're looking wonderful. How are you? Thatcher, this is my attorney, Wendell Parker. Mr. Horton. Any objections if I um, have a private moment with your client? None, if she doesn't. What the hell do you think you're doing? Just asking for what's coming to me. Oh, why didn't you come to me? Why drag a lawyer in? What's the matter? Don't you trust me? Absolutely not. I see. Well, my dear, if my memory serves me correctly, I think it was you who deceived me. 
That's low, Thatcher. Yes, but is it low enough? You gotta promise me. I promise. I won't take his arm off at the socket. I won't even break his nose. You sure you want me to do this? Yes, I'm sure. Bobby, I don't negotiate contracts. It's not what I do. Should have some high-powered attorney for this. Look, I've been through these guys before. They took me for every penny, and it didn't turn out any better. You I trust. Okay, then. Here's the deal. The only way I can negotiate with Horton is to make him think that I can roast him in front of a jury. But if he thinks even for a second that his attorney can make you nuts... Looking at Mr. Sub-Zero. Today is not just practice. So be prepared. I'll do everything to provoke you. I know a little about delivering under pressure. Two playoffs in the championship finals. I remember. Yeah, you do. It's just the entire sports world has forgotten. I bet he knows how I feel. A couple of more off games, Horton will trade him. Fame. How fast it all goes away. Come on, let's show him you still got it. Bobby! How's it going? Kathy, things are great. How are you? Terrific. <laughs> Well, I almost as well as you do. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, this is Ken Malansky, my lawyer. Kathy Grant, tennis superstar. Hey, I'm a fan. Never forget that time you beat Martina on that tiebreaker in Paris. Neither will I. <laughs> well, we're due upstairs. Give him hell. Hey, you too. Now, Mr. Horton, let me go over a few things about depositions so we won't have any misunderstandings. Young man. I have been deposed more times than you're likely to do the job in your entire career. Uh, I know I'm under oath, so why don't you just go at me best you can. Give it both barrels, okay? Right. Mr. Horton, are you the owner of a hockey team uh, known let as... Let me help you out here. Look, I own this arena and the teams that go with it. Um, I employed your client as a player on my hockey team, and one year he even started. Turning your attention to the playing season a few uh, I'm years sorry, ago... Excuse me just a minute. Thank you, dear. Sorry about this. Doctor's orders. Oh. Okay, now, um, where were we? Was that the year that my client not only started, but was team captain? Two seasons ago, uh, yes, he was. And did he injure his right knee in the last game of the regular season before the playoffs? Uh, yes, he did. <clears throat> Terrible thing. And did the doctor tell you he ran the risk of permanent injury if he played again before having surgery on the knee? Well, now, I believe there were several medical opinions. That could have been one of them. Lord knows I paid enough doctor bills for your boy there. <laughs> Sir, just answer my questions. Sorry. Didn't you come to my client and ask him to lead the team in the playoffs? I did not. Didn't you tell him? That the only chance the team had of winning the Stanley Cup was if he played? No, as a matter of fact, I had two players ready in his position who were just as good, some say even better. Now, don't give me that look, Bobby. You know as well as I do. You started the year hot as a pistol, but the last third, you kind of fell apart. Who are you going to replace me with, huh? Rogers? At my worst, I'll skate him off the ice. Isn't it a fact that you promised my client that if he played and was injured, you'd take care of him? It is not. Isn't it a fact that you promised him a job in management that would be equal to the balance of his contract? No way. Come on, Counselor. My entire front office doesn't make as much as I was paying him. Isn't it a fact that you Son, even... the fact is, you're a boy here, and I mean no disrespect to somebody who has been a good player. The truth is... Your boy here has some big expenses. I mean, he got a little greedy. Women, fast cars, some say cocaine. Hey, that is a lie. Let's go off the record, please. I did not personally believe it, but like I said, he had a lot of expenses. Sure, he wanted to play. Hell, he needed money. Hey, what I wanted was a championship. Stop it, Bobby. Took a chance, and he lost. Too bad, I'm sorry, but that's the way it goes. Got in the fast lane, you couldn't handle it. You got greedy, kid. That's pathetic, but you're washed hey, up. Hey, you son of a... Bobby, get off. I'm fine. That's enough for today. We'll reschedule this deposition at a oh, time when... Counselor, this deposition is finished now. So is your client, so why don't you just leave, hmm? Stop it! Who the hell does he think he is? He is lying! 
That's enough! No, it is not enough! Not for him! I'll tear his head off! Maybe then he'll tell the truth! You were on your way to New York. What happened? Uh, we had a little equipment failure on the plane. They're working on it now. I'll just fly out again in the morning. So, uh, tonight I'm yours. Can I ask you something? Sure. You hear me when I came in just now? Mm-hmm. Could have been anybody. You seem pretty relaxed. <laughs> you should know by now, but not much frightens me. Maybe you were expecting somebody? <laughs> Would you care? <laughs> I might. Darling, you know that I'm as true to you as you are to me. Yes, I'm sure you are. much better idea. Why don't you join me? I might just do that. You might just join me or you might just break my neck. Don't go away. I'll be right back. I need to leave a message, oh, please. Good morning, Mr. Malansky. May I assume you're down here looking for work? I'm Robert Spencer's attorney. 
What are you holding them on? I do believe you have your work cut out for you. Why? Thatcher Horton was found shot to death at his home last night. Horton? We found the gun in your client's car. And here the poor boy just can't seem to remember where he was. And there's another thing. Eric, would you be kind enough to pass me that lab report, please, sir? The lab confirms that gun was the same gun that was used to kill Thatcher Horton. We are now charging your client with the crime of murder. Would you give me a few minutes with my client, please? Ken, I didn't kill anyone. What happened? I don't remember. But the last thing I remember, I was in this bar. Don't ask me which one. I wake up this morning, the cops are pounding on my Did door. They have a I don't know. I mean, they're all over the place. And then one of them comes in and says he found a gun that had recently been fired. Was it your gun? I don't have a gun. What I have is a splitting headache. Can you get me out of here? Harry? Yes. You haven't touched your breakfast. I'm reading a brief. Your eggs will get cold. <coughs> oh, I finally have all the plans for the fishing trip. I thought the fishing trip was canceled. Judge Blaine and I have arranged everything. He and Mr. Higgins are going to meet in San Francisco day after tomorrow. And then you're all going to Vancouver. Two weeks of fishing with a judge who's never ruled for me and a lawyer who can only talk about his fees. Ooh. Perry, you need a vacation. I've had a vacation. <laughs> Too late to change your mind. Mason. We go before the judge tomorrow morning. Now, if we can get you out on bail... Oh, wait, wait, wait. if... Ken, you got to get me out of here. It's not quite that simple, Mr. Spencer. Don't forget you've been charged with murder. Yeah, but I didn't do it. I'm innocent. Besides, I can't actually prove I did do it. What about the gun? Any idea how it got in your car? Look, I already told Ken I don't remember how I got home, even where I was. And your threat to violence against Mr. Horton. Listen, if they put away everybody who hated Horton, there wouldn't be enough jails to hold them. Hey, whose side are you on anyway? I'm looking at the prosecution's case. Motive, opportunity, murder weapon. I've seen men convicted on less. Yeah, well, then why are you wasting your time talking to me? Besides, I don't have the money to pay a big-time lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. I'm only here as a favor to Ken. Oh, this is a favor? You come down here and tell me I'm definitely going to prison? Hey, idiot. Man, you obviously don't believe me. I mean, you think I'm a liar, maybe even a killer. Man, why don't you take a walk? Good idea. Brilliant. What? Chances, aren't you? The evidence against him is substantial. He has you. I wish I felt better about that, too. Poor oh, Ken. He can't be in better hands. Uh, I don't know, Amy. Besides, you have me. And I'm not referring to the fact that we've now been engaged five months, three weeks, and two days. I meant that professionally. What's that supposed to mean? I'm sure you've noticed that it's been weeks, well, months, actually, since I've asked to be involved in your work. I have noticed and been grateful. But why do I think that's about to end? Before you develop an unfortunate attitude, well, there are a few things I think you should be aware of. Like what? Well, like for the past few months, I've been enrolled in the university's police science program. You what? Investigative techniques, criminalistics, procedures. I think I'm really ready to help you, uh, Ken. Amy. Ken, I don't want to be a dilettante all my life. I want to do something constructive. And I've been working really hard to prepare myself so that we can be a team. I was hoping that you'd be pleased. 
I am pleased and proud and impressed. But this is a murder trial. So? So I'm not sure that I'm even up to it. Much less uh, me. Well. Ken, you really don't have any confidence in me, do you? I, I never said that. You don't have to. Amy, try to understand. Oh, I understand. You're worried about this case. And since it's a serious case, you don't want me underfoot. That's not what I'm worried about. Oh, what are you worried about? I was wrong to represent Bobby Spencer at the deposition. And a murder trial's worse. It's out of the question. I'm too close to this guy. <sighs> Can you go back to Perry? I doubt it. Well, if you change your mind, he's giving another lecture at the police science department tomorrow. I know, because I'm going. Amy, the door's locked. There, you see? With your keen deductive powers, you certainly don't need me. I'm really sorry about that. Bob's not really like that. Dan, just... you've got some real problems with your case. The main one is your client. I know, and I know I'm asking a lot. Ken. I need more than advice. I need you on the case. Everybody has a first murder trial. This case needs you, not someone first time out. Now, before you make any snap judgments about Bob, let me just tell you this. He and I practically grew up together. He's from a very poor family, and his father deserted him when he was 10, and he's been supporting a bunch of them ever since. When he lost his income from hockey, it wasn't just him that was hurt. It was seven other people who depend on him for their livelihood. Robert Spencer is innocent. He couldn't commit this crime. How much of that would have been your opening remarks in the civil suit? Well, I... <sighs> First part. Very effective. Especially the part about the seven people. However, I'd specify who they were, give them names so the jury sees them as real people, not just numbers. On the whole, not bad. When we were in law school, you told us never to get personally involved with our clients. Well, I can't help it. I'm too close to this. He's my friend. I know he made a lousy impression on you, and I haven't got a right to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Please take the case. If you can't do it for him, then do it out of friendship for me. You want me to break my own rule? Take the case for a friend. Well, let me tell you. When we get to court, if there's a summation, it's all yours. $250,000 bail. How'd you swing the money, by the way? I didn't. Mr. Mason did. Oh. Uh, about the bail. Thank you. Listen, uh, I may have been a little rough on you yesterday. I just want you to know that it wasn't personal. Neither is what I'm going to tell you. I got you out on bail because Ken asked me to. I also like having my clients looking healthy and fit and confident when they walk into court. So I booked you into a room here. I don't want you to leave this hotel. There's a great health club downstairs, and I hope you use it. Under no circumstances are you to have alcohol, visitors, or talk to the press. Is that clear? Well, maybe I should just go back to jail. Maybe you should. Any questions? Yeah. Who's paying your fee? No fee. Every decade or so, I take on a client like you just for the hell of it. There's his key. All right. Who would you pick to a friend, Spencer? 
Probably someone who saw him threaten Horton earlier in the day. And who might that be? People in the waiting room. Kathy Grant. The tennis star? Horton's son, Stuart, and somebody else, Temple Brown. The basketball player. You really think one of them could have been the murderer? Well, it's certainly possible. But which of them had a motive? All right, I'm going to check around inside, and you... And I'll check around outside. Well, Mrs. Horton, outside of a bit of black, very few mortals would realize the depth of your grief. Coffee? No, thank you. You know... If I were to tell you that my husband and I had a marriage based on love, you'd know that I was lying. Thatcher and I, however, were friendly, if not true friends. How's that for honesty? Refreshing, as far as it goes. I hope that means I'm a suspect. I have always wanted to be considered capable of murder. As long as I was innocent, of course. I'll be sure to make a note of that. Now, just before you married your late husband, there were great rumors about a prenuptial agreement. I'm sure you'll find out they were more than just rumors. I remember them so well. The agreement provided that I get half a million dollars a year for three years if my husband divorced me. Nothing if I divorced him. And they say they repealed the Fugitive Slave Act. They also say he had a new girlfriend. <laughs> he always had a new girlfriend. This one was supposed to be serious. Relatively speaking, Thatcher strayed. He was not stolen. Now, if there's nothing else... No, no. Nothing at the moment. However, I'm sure we'll meet again. Amy. Of course. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? What, what are you doing here? Isn't it obvious? Working. And thank goodness I already photographed where the killer landed before you completely Working decimated... on my case? Oh, is this your case? When I was hired as Della's assistant, all I knew was that some young green lawyer was going to help you. Amy, before. you went to Perry Mason behind my back. To be more precise, I went to Dallas Street and proposed an entry-level position for myself. You know I exactly what I mean, Amy. You finished? Quite. Ah, oh, I see you've met Della's new assistant. Yeah. Let's uh, take a look at all of this. Ken, would you go to where the killer was? You can stay on this side of the wall. Now... I'm in the spot the police marked as the place Horton was standing when he was shot. Ken, how far apart are we? About 20 feet. At least 20 yards. All's forgiven. You can come back now. Horton had just gotten himself a drink. He was probably moving around. Like that. We shot three times in a pattern no larger than two inches by a killer 20 yards away, shooting through curtains. The killer was a hired gun. Yeah, the average person about to commit a crime of passion would have their heart pounding, their hands shaky, and they... Well, according to everything I've read, anyway. Expertly planned and executed. Only a professional could have done it. Any of our suspects could have hired the killer. Even if they had an alibi at the time of the murder, they could still be guilty. Top marks to both of you. Well, as long as that first row of seats is 30 feet from the baseline, it should be okay. Let's go look. Hello well, again? Ken Lansky. Sure, Bobby's attorney. Could I talk to you for a few minutes? Of course. I'll meet you downstairs, okay? You know, I don't think for a second that Bobby did it. 
I'll tell you anything I can to help him out. Thank you. Uh, how well do you know Thatcher Horton? We were in a business deal together, organizing a women's celebrity pro tennis tour. <laughs> Whatever happened to that, I remember reading all the advanced publicity and then suddenly it was canceled. Well, he said he couldn't do it. But you quit the pro circuit in order to go into business with him. I felt I was beginning to burn out. It seemed like a good opportunity. Your contract with Mr. Horton required that you render exclusive services in exchange for very little money. You were giving up the possibility of millions on the pro tour. I would have been part owner, and I would have made it up on the back end. Look, I thought you wanted me to help you with Bobby. Why these questions? It's my job to see who might have had reason to kill Thatcher Horton. How I may have felt about Thatcher Horton wouldn't have made any difference. I was busy taping a late night talk show when he was shot. About uh, 300 people saw me. Satisfied? It's possible that the killer was a hired gun. What's that got to do with me? Didn't you threaten him with a lawsuit over the collapse of your business partnership? He was going to settle with me. What made you think he'd treat you any differently than anybody else? He would have settled with me. Excuse me. I'm looking for Stuart Horton. I haven't seen anybody. I just work on plants. Well, that's certainly a healthy bromeliad. What's your secret? No secret. I change the soil. That's interesting. This particular orchid doesn't grow in soil. Oh, really? Well, I'll keep that in mind. Yes. Keep that in mind. M Mr. Mason. Yes? Mr. Horton's running a little late. I'll wait. Pain, frustration, and disappointment. It's not religion or politics, it's money. Take a look at this. Too bad we can't cash in. Offering $50,000 for information about who shot Thatcher Horton. I thought they caught the guy who did it. Maybe they caught the wrong guy. You know anyone selling hot guns? Charlie, you're not doing a little business on the side, are you? <laughs> I got a workout. I don't want to talk about it no more. Looks like a moment to divide and conquer. You take Temple Brown. Right. Only authorized personnel in here. I'm Robert Spencer's attorney. Yeah? So? So I talked to the bartender at one of the clubs Spencer visited the night of the murder. He says you were there and that you bought my client a drink. Yeah, so you say. Look, we can do this one of two ways. You can talk to me now or in court. I don't much care which. Your choice. My choice, huh? Well, my choice is to get on with my workout. If you want to talk, you keep up. Sorry about your father. If you don't mind, I have a few questions. Well, of course. Were you and he very close? 
Well, my mother died when I was 15, and after that, all my father and I had was each other. Thanks, Danny. But he sent you away to school. Yes, that's right, military boarding school. Which was very good for me. It taught me discipline for the first time, then college. But we spent every summer and all my vacations together. <laughs> Sounds like a great life. Mr. Mason, my father was a difficult man. It wasn't easy being his son. How about being his employee? Worse. No longer a problem, is it? All his wealth, position, and power are yours now. Eventually, it would have been mine anyway. He was grooming me to take over. You paint a very different picture than the one I've gotten. I was told your father paid you no more than a secretary, gave you no authority. And from his memos, I gathered he knew for certain you were afraid to leave your job or afraid to stay. Well, I know one thing for certain, Mr. Mason. I'm not afraid of you. Spencer's guilty. He's going to pay for it. Sure, I saw him at the club. I even bought him a drink. Feel sorry for the fool. Fool? Trust in what? Even if he says what he claims he did, the man's word wasn't worth spit. What time did you see my client that night? More or less. It's hard to say. I was with a lot of people. Last thing I wanted to talk about was that old man. Sounds like you didn't like Horton much. My father was a real hard dude, but smart. You almost had to respect him. What about the son? I saw you with him today. What was that all about? The son's stupid. Thinks the way to get me to play better is to threaten to trade me to an expansion team. I've been your best year. Well, cold in the clutch a couple of times. That happens to everybody. It's not what the sports writers are saying. They're really sticking it to you. Yeah. I'd like to see one of them put it in. 17,000 people screaming at you. 22 feet out. One second on the clock. Played somewhere. High school? Some in college? Yeah. You almost good. <laughs> These are plastered all over the arena. Bailiff at court had one. I've been passing them out. I have six high school kids helping. $50,000 reward for information revealing seller or purchaser of Thatcher Horton murder gun. 357 Desert Eagle automatic. Serial numbers filed. Cracked handle and silencer. Straightforward, not too dramatic. Also, $100,000 for information leading to the identity of the true killer. An incentive program. I wanted to appeal to the truly greedy as well as the borderline weasel. It's incredible. Thank you. I don't think that's what Ken had in mind. Uh, honey, what you've done is... Extremely dangerous. You could be hurt. But it's so practical. Amy... A lot of people will read this. You even left your home phone number. Of course. I didn't want Della bothered with all those calls. I didn't leave my home address. Besides, who would hurt me? The killer. Oh. So, what are we going to do? Well, she'll have to stay close to you. I'm afraid you'll have to put aside whatever disagreements you have, at least for the moment. I'll stay close, but I'd rather not. I'll stay close to her. But I'd rather not either. Would you wait a minute, Amy? Charlie left here about an hour ago. Just ran out the door. Where? Not a clue. Except that she was real excited. Like winning the lottery or something. Money. Lots of money. Like falling from the sky. I mean, one minute she was reading that flyer, the next minute she was gone. You know, she must know something about that Thatcher Horton murder.
Hey, if Charlie gets that cash, you tell him that Al's entitled to a half of it. <laughs> I was the one who gave him the flyer. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Spencer, Dollar Street. We've spoken on the phone. I can't get so much as a beer in this hotel. I told you, no alcohol. I don't like being treated like a child. If, when this is over, you are a free man, you can have a thousand drinks of anything you like. Until then, try iced tea. I just got your message, dear. Yeah, I was looking for Ken. Do you know where he is? He was supposed to be with you. Oh, no, no, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Listen, um, if he comes back to the hotel, you tell him I got a message on my answering machine. Some woman named Charlie wants to meet at 5.30. She says she sold this killer the gun. Someone's at the door. I gotta go. Bye. Sorry. Nice watch. Listen, what I'm interested in is a 357 Desert Eagle with filed off serial numbers and a cracked handle. Sold one like that last week. How about letting me in? Uh, no, we can talk here. Uh, can you tell me about it? People don't give their names. Well, can you describe them? Not really. Look, what I expected was the name or at least a description of the buyer. That's why there's a reward. Listen, why don't we go out for a drink, some dinner? Maybe my memory will come back. Uh, I don't think so. I have plans with my fiance. All right. She's late. She said 5.30. You're sure this is the right place? Yes. I think so. Who's that? Charlie? Are you Amy? We were worried you wouldn't show. We need to talk to you. Yeah, and I need you like I need a funeral. Charlie, a man's life could depend upon your testimony. We really yeah, well, my life depends on getting out of town. You blew it. I'm out of here. Well, we did blow it. to make coffee. Oh, thanks. Just one cup. You don't have to feel compromised. I won't seduce you. 
Look, I really can't stay. Ken? Someone took the tape from my answering machine. That's how the man knew about the meeting with Charlie. Who was in the house? No one. I didn't let anyone in. Amy, that means somebody broke in. Oh, God. The man who came to see me today. Maybe he's the killer. And I let him get away. Oh, Ken. I made such a mess of this. I'm a failure as a detective. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Come here. <laughs> Look, we, we wouldn't have gotten this close without you. And don't forget, you can identify him if we see him again. That could be very important. Think so? Absolutely. for you to tell me that this is a perfect example of why I shouldn't be involved in this at all. But, yeah, well, but you didn't. You stood by me when I needed you. Ken. You've given me the strength to go on. I have? Definitely. All I need is a good night's rest and, well... Tomorrow's another day. You don't learn, do you? What do you mean? Well, what I mean is you almost got the three of us killed today and you're ready to start up again tomorrow so nothing happened. I think I liked you better when I was weak and vulnerable. Well, I don't think we should discuss this tonight. Yes, if I were you, I'd leave while I was ahead. Come on. What are you doing? You're not staying here. A man broke into this house. It's not safe. You're staying with me. Now, come on. Well, when you put it like that, what can I say? I thought you said you wouldn't seduce me. I have to pick up some of Dad's papers from his study. See you every day, but I just couldn't take the chance for your sake. For my sake? Sweetheart, I don't blame you, but if people found wait out. Wait a minute, about... wait a minute. You think that I killed him? Honey, I can't blame you. I should hope not. I assume that you did it. Me? Oh, oh my, look at your face. I can't believe how well you lie. I'm going to have to reconsider a couple of things you have told me with so much conviction. I hope I'm not interrupting family business. Actually, we were just talking about the murder. Anything new on the investigation? Yes, that's uh, why I'm here. More questions, Mr. Horton. I'll be in my father's office if you need me. All right, ask away. I just hope this theory is a little more interesting than your last theory. I think it will hold your interest. The phone call to your stepson on the night of the murder. Phone call? The records from the phone company say it took place almost at the time of the shooting. We know that because the call to the police was less than two minutes later. Is this leading somewhere? Yes. You're telling me who placed the call? Well, let me see. I was in the bathtub when the shooting happened. So apparently my husband called his son. 
I would guess to tell him that he wasn't going to New York after all. Wouldn't you think? The operator at your stepson's answering service remembers hearing a woman's voice. Mr. Mason, don't you know anything? An answering service has two real functions. One is to put you on hold, and the other is to write down your message incorrectly. Will there be anything else? I wouldn't be at all surprised. You look very comfortable in your father's chair. I am. What can I do for you, Mr. Mason? I was wondering why your stepmother called you the night of the murder. Well, you already asked Linda that question, didn't you? Now I'm asking you. Why? To see if we say the same thing? That's part of it. Well, why would you care what Linda and I discussed? I want to know who hired the killer that murdered your father, that's all. I'd suggest you and Linda get your story straight before the trial. The band was silver with these big chunks of turquoise on it? Mm hmm. Yes, I know the one you mean. It had one with either a man or a woman's watch set into it. Have you sold many of them? Mm, well, four, five. Four or five in the last couple of months. By any chance that you sell one to a man about. 35, receding hairline, long sideburns, and really piercing blue eyes about mm, this tall? Blue eyes. Yes, you know, I think I do remember selling one to someone like that. Why? He lost it in the bar where I work. He seemed like a good guy, and the watch looked like it cost a fortune. Mm -hmm. It did. <laughs> do you have it? No. No, my boss has it. And he won't return it until somebody claims it. Hmm? If you could just give me the guy's name. Oh, no, I don't think I should do that. <sighs> Miss, this is the fourth store I've tried. I'm tired and I'm not going to argue with you. If you don't give me the name, as far as I'm concerned, my boss can just keep the okay, watch. And... Okay, okay, okay. Let me see if I've got the credit card slip. the killer, you won't need to go to court. You know where to find him? As a matter of fact, I do. Where is he? I'll show you. No, you'll tell me where he is, and you'll wait here, understand? Absolutely. I mean, you're agreeing with me? I've learned my lesson.
need the money. And I want it now. You think that makes any difference? You think the cops are really going to care about that? Terrific. times have we done this? Every time is like the first time for me. Well, hi, Della. Mr. Mason. Don't you look handsome. We're doing court in a half an hour. I doubt they'll start without us. There's something I want to say before we start. Just so it's not a confession. Well, it is sort of. Sort of an apology. I know I've been kind of a jerk. I'll sort of accept your apology. Look, I, I've, I've always had a temper. I, maybe, maybe that's why I was so good at hockey in the beginning. You know? I'm sure it wasn't brains. Huh? Hell, I'd never even gotten through college on my own. Ken pulled me through. He's a good friend. Probably better than I deserve. Look, the only thing I've ever been able to do really well is hockey. When I got hurt, and all of a sudden I lost that, I hated everybody, because I, uh, well, I felt like I didn't have anything left. That's, that's why I acted the way I did. I see. I mean, at first, I, I didn't even care whether I won or lost the case. No. No, I, well, I appreciate all you've done. All you're doing. I just wanted you to know that before we start. And I want to win. Well... Let's do exactly that. Tell me, Lieutenant, after the arresting officers found People's Exhibit A under the seat in the defendant's car, what was done with it? I sent it up to the lab for a ballistics check. And what did you find? We found that we had a perfect match. That gun was positively identified as the one that was used to shoot and to kill that's your Horton. Thank you, Lieutenant. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. I do reserve the right to recall. Mr. Mason. Yes, Your Honor. I always have questions of Lieutenant Brock. Lieutenant Brock, how many times was the deceased shot? Three times, Mr. Mason. How close were the entry points of the bullets? Here's the coroner's report for your recollection. Uh, just a moment. Mr. Molansky. With the court's permission? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Molansky will be standing at the same distance Thatcher Horton was from the killer, assuming you to be the killer. Now, Lieutenant, I ask you once again, how close were the three entry points? The three shots came all within a diameter of two inches, Mr. Mason. About the size of a silver dollar 
quite a shot. You're a trained marksman, Lieutenant. Could you do that? Not on my best day, Mr. Mason. Shots would have to be almost simultaneous, wouldn't they? Otherwise, if the victim moved, turned, or fell, the target area would change. That is correct. Could you get off three rounds that quickly, Lieutenant? Well, probably not, but Mr. Mason, I'm not a professional athlete. I don't have the defendant's hands, I don't have his eyes, or I don't have his reflexes, sir. Very well, Lieutenant. You just mentioned the defendant's physical capabilities. Dr. McLeod, would you please stand? Dr. McLeod has been attending Robert Spencer for several years. He's prepared to testify that two years ago, the defendant injured his right hand. It then became arthritic, leaving his trigger finger with limited mobility. Uh, thank you, doctor. If that is true, how could Robert Spencer fire quickly enough to hit that target as it moved? Objection. Speculation. Your Honor, the lieutenant has investigated, what, dozens of shootings? Well, no, I said more closer to a hundred, Mr. Mason. I suggest he more than qualifies as an expert. I'll allow it. Thank you. Now, Lieutenant, in your expert opinion, could a marksman with an arthritic condition and impaired mobility to his trigger finger have fired those three shots quickly enough to have hit that target as it moved? Probably not, Mr. Mason. Well, Lieutenant, if he couldn't hit the target, he couldn't kill the target. No further questions. Redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Lieutenant, is there any reason the accused couldn't have fired with his left hand? Objection calls for speculation. I'll allow it. Fair is fair, Mr. Mason. He could have, the defendant could have used his left hand. What about accuracy? Well, there again, at the distance in question, it would depend on how steady the hand, how good the eyes. Now, if a good athlete was motivated, he very easily could have done it. All hypothetically speaking, of course. No more questions, Your Honor. Mr. Mason, recross? Uh, no recross, Your Honor. You may step down, Lieutenant Brock. Ms. August? The people rest, Your Honor. Lieutenant. Nice dollar. Mr. Mason, is the defense prepared to call his first witness? Yes, Your Honor. Defense calls Kathy Grant. Miss Grant, would you please tell the court how well you knew the deceased? We were business associates. We were attempting to put together a women's tennis project. The project was scrapped, was it not? Yes, it was. We have information that Thatcher Horton was planning to get married again. Can you tell us to whom? How would I know? because you were involved in his plans. Now, Thatcher Horton planned to get married again. So I ask you again, would you tell us to whom? All right, well, he did ask me to marry him, but I didn't take him seriously. But Mr. Horton was certainly a serious man, was he not? He spoke to his lawyers about divorcing his wife, did he not? Yes, well, he told me he did. He also mentioned naming me in a new will. A new will? Hmm. Then suddenly he broke things off. Then, within weeks, your business partnership with him collapsed. All that is true, is it not? No, no, that's not true. Isn't it true that you were personally and professionally betrayed by him? Isn't it true that when you demanded he compensate you, he refused? I learned the hard way what Thatcher was really like, but I didn't kill him. As a matter of fact, he didn't break it off with me. I told him I wouldn't marry him. Wouldn't marry him or couldn't marry him? 
couldn't marry him. One of the wealthiest men in the country, the single most powerful man in sports. Now, what could you possibly say in the way of rejection? I had told him I was already married. I married a boy who was in the Air Force when I was 16. We didn't tell anyone because I was so young. He got his wings about the same time I turned pro. One day he was on a routine mission. There was an accident. He lost both of his legs. He told me I could go out and date. We could get a divorce. When Thatcher asked me to marry him, I thought about it, but I couldn't go through with it. I couldn't get a divorce. I knew it would kill him. I couldn't do that. I'm very sorry. No further questions. The witness is excused. This being the hour for our lunch recess, court will adjourn until one o'clock. Record, please. Linda Horton. Mrs. Horton, you are the widow of the deceased? I am. We were married for nearly five years. And would you describe your marriage as a happy one? I would describe it as successful. You just heard Kathy Grant testify that your husband asked her to marry him. How does that square with your definition of a successful marriage? I know nothing about that. You had no indication? None. No intuition? None. Absolutely. Mrs. Horton. I find it difficult to believe a bright, sensitive woman like yourself had no idea her husband was about to divorce her. Mr. Mason, my husband was notorious for his liaisons. In my experience, he took them to bed, not to the altar. Uh, Your Honor, may I have a moment? Yes, Mr. Mason. Now, you say you didn't know your husband was about to divorce you. But you do know about your husband's will. I have a copy of it right here. Just obtained from the clerk's office. I'd like to have it marked as defendants next in order. Without objection, so order. This document makes you equal with your husband's son, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Approximately, what would that share be worth? I couldn't say. Come now, in round numbers, in excess of $100 million? I suppose so. But if your husband left you, if not for Kathy Grant, then for another woman, your prenuptial agreement would provide you with $500,000 a year for three years, but you would inherit nothing. I suppose. Wouldn't you also suppose that you're much better off with your husband dead than alive? At least a hundred million dollars better off? Objection. Speculation, argumentative, and harassing the witness. I really would like to answer that, if you don't mind. The court will allow it. I had an intuition you might bring this up. 
So, I came prepared. This is a copy of the most recent will that my husband drew. His lawyer will file that for probate today. He gave me that several weeks ago. You'll notice that his son, Stuart, gets everything. I inherit nothing. For which you have my deepest condolences. I would imagine your grief would only be eased by another marriage. This one, perhaps to your stepson. Objection. Sustained. I have no more questions of this witness. Do you have any idea what time it is? Where the hell are you? What? It was in that room over there. How'd you find him? It was easy. How easy? Well, first of all, I assumed he was still in town since you'd heard him demanding a payoff. I didn't think he'd leave until he got it, which could take some time. So far, I'm with you. The only thing I knew for certain was that he wouldn't go back to the warehouse. So I deduced that since he was in hiding, he wouldn't have access to his own phone. So you decided to stake out every payphone in town? I staked out the phone he was using. That one. How'd you find it? Through the phone company. I thought he might be using a credit card. Turns out I was right. A motherly type at the local branch helped me out after I sort of explained to her that there he is. Let's go, Sherlock. You say the sweetest things. Don't tell anybody. somebody to pick up the money Horton's son it's gotta be call the cops
Something to die for. Okay. Well, one thing we know. We certainly won't be getting any information from that one. Interesting that the hitman had a key to the arena itself, but not to the executive offices. Well, sir, that's probably because there are more arena keys floating around, in which case that would make them easier to steal. But when he gets inside, it's not to meet anyone. He wanted something from Stuart Horton's office. I wonder what he was after. That we will never know. Good night, all. I know people who would call that withholding evidence. He dropped it before he was shot. Why don't you tell the good lieutenant we'd like to study it for a couple of hours? Great. I'll order some coffee. Very hot. Very black. <laughs> really think that this could be the answer? At this point, it had better be. Your Honor, I'd like to place this item in evidence as defense exhibit number seven. May I see it, Mr. Mason? Mr. Mason. Yes, Your Honor, I call Stuart Horton to the stand. Mr. Horton. You are the only child and sole heir of the deceased, are you not? I am, but I didn't know anything about that new will until yesterday when my stepmother took it from her purse. I see. You uh, worked for your father, did you not? I was vice president of his company. Large title, modest paycheck. Well, I was being trained to take over. But with that modest paycheck, you support a penthouse here in town? Yes. A ski house in Aspen? Beach house in California? That's true. Objection. Even for one of Mr. Mason's great fishing expeditions, we seem to be on a rather long line of irrelevancy here. Mr. Mason, I agree with the prosecution. I'm about to connect up, Your Honor. Quickly, Mr. Mason. How do you manage to live so well on so little, Mr. Horton? I inherited quite a lot of money from my mother. But you gambled that away, did you not? In fact, there was quite an unpleasant moment with your father over your betting on sports, was there not? He told me to stop, and I did. <clears throat> your Honor, I would like the clerk to show Mr. Horton defense exhibit number seven. Certainly, Miss Jackson. Now, Mr. Horton, would you examine that notebook, please, and tell me if you recognize it? I don't. You don't recognize it? No. Even if I told you the man who was shot last night in your sports arena, took it from the desk in your office? I've never seen it before. That brings me to my last order of business with you, Mr. Horton. I'm going to ask you about your relationship with your stepmother. Is it not true that you and your stepmother are lovers? Yes. I can't hear you. You're lovers. You hated your father, did you not? Yes. You hated him so much, you felt so humiliated by him, that you made love to his wife in his own house. Yes. I made love to her. Yes, I hated him. But I didn't kill him. I didn't kill him. I have no further questions. But I reserve the right to recall this witness, Your Honor. No questions, Your Honor. 
You may step down, Mr. Horton. Mr. Mason. I call Temple Brown. Mr. Brown, you're a member of Mr. Horton's basketball team, are you not? That's right. Two years ago, you were even voted onto the all-star team, weren't you? I was one of the top scorers in the league. One of the all-time greats. Now, would you please examine this notebook? Never seen it. Suppose I told you that the man who stole that book from Stuart Horton's desk was a hired killer. The same hired killer who shot and killed Thatcher Horton. Yeah, I don't know. That's yeah, just a notebook with some scribbles in it. But very interesting scribbles. Would you please read the top line? Boston by at least four fifty thousand dollars. Would you identify this bank statement for the record? It's mine. Mark does defendants next in order. Now. What is that deposit there? $50,000. $50,000. Made the day after your team lost to Boston. Suppose I told you I could match up at least 25 games last year with point spreads listed in this book and deposits in several of your accounts. I don't know. Mr. Brown, I am sorry. I'm sorry about you. You're a cheat. You threw games, shaved points, you broke faith with your teammates, you broke faith with your friends and loved ones, but most of all, with the fans who believed in you, all for money. You made plenty. You wanted more. Maybe. Maybe I did. But that's no reason to kill old man Horton. Exactly. No reason to kill Thatcher Horton. Every reason to kill his son, Stuart. That's crazy. Mr. Brown, what would happen to a professional basketball player found betting on games? Suspension. For how long? I don't know. Maybe a year, maybe life. If I don't miss my guess, Stuart Horton found out you were betting on basketball games. He threatened you with a suspension. He then got you to shave points. After that, there was just no turning back. Are you making this up as you go along? Objection. Speculation. Mr. Mason is fishing again. I tend to agree with the counselor. You do seem to be fishing, Mr. Mason. Your Honor, uh, Counselor, uh, I'll tie this up in a minute. Very well, you may proceed, Mr. Mason. Objection overruled. Now, Mr. Brown, you hired that hitman to kill Stuart Horton, did you not? The killer shadowed him until he knew his habits, waiting for the right moment. Do you know what he found? I don't know anything. He found out every time the father left town, the son came over and slept with his wife. And that was the moment he picked for the kill. That's not true, none of it. The father came home unexpectedly, but the killer couldn't know that. All he could see through the curtains was the shadow. Your hired killer killed the wrong man. I don't know what you're talking about. Mr. Brown, your hitman stole that notebook. That notebook and your bank statement ties you to him. It ties you to the murder. When you heard the wrong man was killed, you had to frame somebody fast. You'd heard my client threaten the father. You'd seen him that night on his way to being drunk. It couldn't have been too hard for you or Richards to follow him home and plant the murder weapon. That's just not so. Well, 
Here is something that is so. Your friend, Mr. Richards, died last night in a gun battle with the police. This morning he received... We received some startling news. Ballistics discovered that the bullet that killed him did not come from a police revolver. It came from this gun. This gun, which I would like to enter as defendants next in order. You recognize this gun, Mr. Brown? Lieutenant Brock and my associate, Mr. Molansky, found this gun in your locker. You killed Mr. Richards. After Richards shot the wrong man, he tried to blackmail you. So you followed him. You found him the same time as the police, and you made sure, you made very sure, that he was dead. You had one man killed. You killed another. And next, you had to kill Stuart Horton. Who were you going to kill after that, Mr. Brown? And for what? You think you're so smart. You know what it's like being booed? Thousands of fans yelling at you that you crap. When you know you can make that shot, sports writers just calling you names. When you know in your heart, you still got the stuff. Forced to lose. When you know you're a winner, you know what that's like. But I, I didn't mean for old man. Your Honor, I move all charges against my client be dismissed. The people concur, Your Honor. Defense motion granted. Lieutenant Brock, take this witness into custody for questioning. This court stands adjourned. Thank you. I've got a lot to be thankful for. Give me another chance. I won't waste it. I'm sure you won't. <laughs> you were wonderful, Mr. Mason. Congratulations. No, well, thank you. May we give you two a word of advice? Of sure. I believe there was a minor disagreement. That uh, was nothing. Amy, you feel Ken doesn't have any confidence in you. That's right. Ken, you feel as if Amy has invaded your area of capability and expertise. <laughs> I wouldn't put it that way. I would. May we both point out that both of you, in your separate and individual ways, contributed to the solution of this case. You both were right. Take it from us. Never end a day where one of you is wrong. Today was a great day, and both of you were right. Thank you. No, thank you. And thank you. <laughs> Most everyone that she knows. Marie. I know the creme de creme, and they all agree. You can the me. Choose the one you want to top of the evening. Whose name can open anyone's door? Marie. Who else can offer this and much more?
I mean big trouble. I kept, I kept waiting for a, a, a priest to make an entrance in the second act and administer the last rites. Oh, come on, Tony. The audience loved us. Five curtain calls, for God's sake. This bunch of hicks would give five calls to a lecture on Pinkton. But you know what the New York critics are going to say? We are a sentimental cartoon. We would have been out of date in the 30s. Well, I don't know about the rest of you. I don't need that on my resume. Mel! The first act closer still doesn't work. The song is old fashioned. The lyrics are maudlin. The whole concept is it's prehistoric. I've told you a hundred times we need something tougher. All I hear is, yeah, Tony, sure. Well, I want to hear a new song! I want to hear it by 10 o'clock tomorrow. Well, of course I'm not. Somebody. Anybody. Okay, Mel? Yeah, Tony, sure. It shouldn't be too hard. Old score sounds like it came straight from your trunk. Would somebody mind telling me why six? Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six of our hookers made their entrance late in the police raid. Kate. Okay. You're choreographing our little funeral here. Now, is it too much to ask your hoofers to make their entrance on cue and not whenever they damn well please? Tony, they have a really big change there, and it's not their fault. The intercom, damn... Tony. I beg your pardon? The intercom system wasn't working by the time I got backstage to the dressing room. And, and whose responsibility was it to see that the intercom system was working? Well, you know, I had a lot of new light cues. To... I just asked you a question, Johnny. Okay. It was my responsibility. Oh, like it was your responsibility to make sure that there, there was a pianist at the understudy rehearsal last week? Yes. You are a flake. That's not fair, Tony. If you don't get your shabby little act together, I'm going to make sure you end up swabbing out toilets in some crummy little dinner theater. You've got no right to talk to me that way. Why not? You don't have the guts to do anything about it. Oh, yeah? Hey, what are you doing? Hey, Johnny, for God's sake! Stop it, will you? You're fired, Whitman! Tony! You'll never work another Broadway show again! You hear me? Never! Hey, come on, Tony, come on. Johnny's a hell of a good stage manager, you know that. You just got him a little crazy, that's all. You two just cool off, and then we'll sit down and talk this over, all right? I'm running this show. You get a problem with that, you get yourself another director! I'm sorry, Johnny, I really am. Somebody ought to drive a stake through your heart. You? Yeah, maybe. All right, James. Our crucial scene just kind of lies in the middle of the road like a dead dog. I mean, it's not funny. It's not moving. It's not anything. I think your TV roots are showing. And they're not very pretty. I want it rewritten first thing in the morning. We'll get it rehearsed and into the show by tomorrow night. And while you're at it, look at that first scene between Tom and Amanda, because... Polly Abbott, she was a real woman, not some cheap Mae West impressionist. I thought the scene played pretty well. Well, as usual, you're wrong. Damn it, Tony, you are the most insensitive, insulting, arrogant... Oh, listen person. up here, kiddies. Our fading star, the silver screen, she actually can display an honest emotion. You're a pig, Tony. I'd like to reciprocate. I just don't want to waste my time. 
All right, that's it. <clears throat> but from now on, get ready. Plenty of more changes, because you're going to get them. And Mel, James, I mean it. By tomorrow morning. It's after two o'clock in the morning, for God's sake. Come to there now. Are you out of your mind? How? Did you call the police? No, 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 no. You're right. You're right. If she's okay, it's better to be quiet. I'll be right over. I have to go on down to the theater. A man that tried to kill us. On stage. It's just the kind of thing that hammy old relic would do. I don't know how long I'm going to be down there, so you better get your tail out of here. It's been fun, my dear. We'll do it again sometime. My mama. It's after 2 a.m. Why aren't we asleep? Our knee has its own idea. Well, when did we take our last medication? Ten o'clock. Well, that's good. But I think we should take another pill right now. And I want you to know that we can't be responsible for that watch if it gets stolen. This watch was a Christmas present, and I want you to know that we are completely responsible for it. I'd rather not. I know. But even arthroscopic surgery takes its toll on the system. This is our second night here. And if we want the doctor to discharge us in the morning, then it would be much better if he found us bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I have never had the slightest desire to be bushy-tailed. But we do want to get out of here, don't we? You bet. Now, we should get in bed. You first. You! In bed. Can we manage that by ourselves? Sorry, fella. Wish I could help. Is it? Well, we're really in a good mood today, aren't we? Stella, do me a favor. Don't use the word we. Has the doctor been by yet to release you from the hospital? Nope. <laughs> well, he better get you out of here soon, or you're not going to be fit to re-enter. Johnny Whitcomb, stage manager of the musical Holly, is being taken into custody for the murder of the musical's director, Tony Franken. Now, Whitcomb publicly threatened Franklin's life just hours before the murder, which took place at the Paramount Theater at 2.30 a.m. Witnesses in the neighboring building say they heard the shots at that time, but failed to report them. We'll have details in there. What's the matter, Perry? You know this, Franken? No, but I know that boy didn't kill him. How? I saw him. What's his name? Whitcomb. Right under that street lamp at the time of the murder. Are you sure? I remember looking at my watch as he was standing there, and the theater where this Franken was murdered is at least 
three or four miles from here. What are you going to do? I don't know. It'll likely be a rain this morning. Well, as soon as the doctor releases you, you can just go down and clear the boy. I'm afraid it's not that simple. Just tell him what you told me. Any halfway decent prosecutor would tear me apart. I don't. Adela, get my clothes for me, will you please? I'm going downtown with you. Good. Then you can watch me make a world-class fool of myself. Let's see, Mr. Macy. You believe you saw the defendant on that park bench at about 2.27 a.m., is that right? Yes, I looked at my watch. But you were in a hospital about how many yards away? About 30. And although it was overcast that night, you believe you could make out his features by the streetlight? Yes, I believe so. How was the man you saw dressed? He was wearing the same clothes he has on now, plus an overcoat and a hat. Weren't you in the hospital for some sort of knee surgery? Yes, an arthroscopy. Mr. Mason, were you given some sort of sedation or painkiller before you went to sleep that night? Yes. And that would have been 40 milligrams of oxalidine, wouldn't it? Actually, I'd taken 20 milligrams at 10 p.m. simple yes or no will do. Did you ingest 40 milligrams of oxalidine? Yes. Mr. Mason, is it your testimony that on a moonless night from a hospital room 30 yards away, after ingesting enough medication to put most of us in a coma, you're able to identify this defendant, a stranger whose face you've never seen before, as the man you saw in the park in the middle of the night? Yes, I believe it to have been him. No further questions. The defense rests, Your Honor. Thank you, Counsel. On the basis of the evidence presented here, this defendant shall be bound over to Superior Court for trial on March 15th at 8.30 a.m. Bail shall continue in the amount of $250,000. So after I left the theater, I bought myself a bottle of whiskey and just wandered the streets for a couple of hours, maybe. I guess I was just trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. Do you remember where you went? No, not really. I've never been in this town before. I do remember going to the park. I broke my bottle. I'm glad I went there or you wouldn't have seen me. I'm afraid that doesn't help us. Anyway, after, after that, I went back to the hotel maybe about three. Bought myself another bottle and drank myself into oblivion. I don't remember anything after that. I told the police. Pounded on my door at about 7.30 this morning. And found the gun in your room. Mr. Mason, I swear I never saw that gun before. terrible tragedy, and I know how shocked all of you must be. Nevertheless, I intend for us to open in New York on the 3rd of next month. This morning, I phoned Gavin Austin. He's flying in from New York today to take over as director. Most of you know Gavin, and I'm sure you share my faith in him. We'll see the show tonight, and I've called a rehearsal for him at 10 o'clock tomorrow. We've got a great show here, kids. And although we'll all miss Tony, the show as he would have wanted, will definitely go on. Right now, Mel and James will fill you in on the new material, all right? Mr. Mason, I'm Amanda Cody. I know. I've admired you for years. Uh, and so have I. Thank you. This is my associate, Della Street. Off the street? Hello. Please, it's Della and Perry. Uh, Perry... Is there any way I can convince you to represent Johnny? 
I've, I've called my attorney on the coast, but he isn't a criminal lawyer. After all, you're right here in town already, and I just... You see, Johnny's a very decent young man. He couldn't have done such a thing. I don't think so either. And I am representing him. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, I mean, Johnny will be so pleased. Mr. Mason, my name is Blaine Counter. I'm the producer of Polly. Is there anything I can do for you? I'm Johnny Whitcomb's attorney. My associate, Dell Street. How do you do? Really? Uh, you know, I'm arranging Johnny's bail. Oh. I'll see you both later. We'll look forward to it. Uh, excuse me, but I'm going to go make those calls. Oh, try and locate Ken Melansky. I need to talk to him. Mr. Counter, do you have any idea what Franken was doing here at the theater at 2.30 in the morning? No, I don't. But I just fired the security guard who was supposed to be here all night. Uh, Parker, somebody. A moron left the place at midnight to go see his girlfriend. Where did he come from? Some local employment agency. I don't even know his last name. I'd like the agency address. Oh, of course. I overheard you saying that the production will continue. Yes, it will. But uh, not because of the old showbiz tradition. I happen to have a lot of my own money invested in it. I... An extraordinary faith in Polly. I still have. Without Tony Franken? Well, we've still got Amanda Cody. She'll sell a lot of tickets. Oh, I'm sure of that. She's wonderful. Even last night. Last night? What about last night? Well, I was given to understand that she had a very upsetting call from the coast. But on stage, she was superb. Watching your company just now... I didn't see much evidence that Tony Franken would be missed. Tony Franken was a brilliant theater man, Mr. Mason, but a despicable human being. You still hired him. Well, quite simply, he was the best director I could find. I had to protect my investment as well as my other investors. And, of course, Amanda. Mr. Counter, where were you at the time of the murder? I, I was alone in my hotel room. Why? Pardon me. Uh, here's the list, Perry. I tried to reach Ken, but I could only reach his answering machine. Mr. Counter, I wonder if I might speak to your company for a moment. Of course. All right, hold it a minute. Now listen, kids. This is Mr. Perry Mason. He's Johnny's lawyer, and he'd like to uh, talk to you. Thank you. First, I'd like to tell you all that I have good reason to believe that Johnny Whitcomb did not murder Tony Franken last night. But proving that may be somewhat difficult. Now, I understand there was an after-theater party given for you last night by the City Theater Society, which some of you apparently did not attend. Mr. Mel Singer and wife Leslie, Mr. James Walton, Mr. Blaine Counter, and Amanda Cody. Everyone else seems to have been at the party until it ended, nearly 3 a.m., is that correct? Well, what does that mean? Well, if everyone who went to the party can prove they were there the whole time, that gives them a pretty good alibi. Those not at the party are suspect in Tony Franken's murder. Suspect until we find out which one of you killed him. It's Lieutenant now, isn't it? Good to see you again, Ed. I appreciate your meeting me here. You too, officer. Just call me Ray. All right, Ray. This was Tony Franken's room. We cleared out all the evidence. Any pictures? Ray, pictures... To this picture, Mr. Franken must have had a visitor the night of the murder. Mm -hmm. Any prints? Layton's. We couldn't get a match, so we sent him back to Washington. I'd like to know what took Franken to the theater at 2.30 in the morning. Well, I figured Whitcomb must have called him with some cock and bull story. Mind showing me where you found the gun? 
Room 511, Ray. That was Whitcomb's room. Now, the gun was right here behind these soft drink bottles. And who found the body? The cleaning crew from the theater at about 7 in the morning. Who told you about the threat Whitcomb made to Frank? The producer of the show, Mr. Counter. We called him and asked him to come down to identify the body. He told us the whole story. Luring Frank into the theater sounds pretty complicated, since that was Franken's room right there, and this is Johnny's room right here. But a shot would have wakened the whole hotel. And since Franklin was right next door, Johnny probably could have heard that he had a visitor. That visitor could be very important, wouldn't you say, Lieutenant? Miss Massey, a Miss Street called for you. She left this message where you could find a guy called Molesky or something. Molesky. Thank you, Ray. You'll let me know about the prints on that glass. Will do, Mr. Mason. Thank you for your help. Now, Mrs. Pitts, you heard Mrs. Gilman testify that at approximately 9.30 p.m. on the night of March 3rd, your son, Walter, held her up at gunpoint and stole $173 from her, as well as forcing her to remove and hand over her underpants. Now, I ask you, Mrs. Pitts, where was your son, Walter, actually on the night of March 3rd this year? We was at my house, looking at TV the whole night. The whole night? Could you be a little more specific? Well, Walter come over just as Vanna was given a car away on Wheel of Fortune, and he didn't leave till right after Johnny Carson's monologue. You see, Johnny had Alan Thick guesting, and Walter don't like him a lot. Thank you, Mrs. Pitts. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. You can step down. You are excused. I call Father Alan Rooney. Do you solemnly swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I do. State your name for the record, please. I'm Father Alan Rooney. Father Rooney, where were you on the night of March 3rd? I was at St. Sebastian's Church, as I am every Thursday night, calling the numbers. Could you explain that, Father? We have bingo every Thursday night uh, for the benefit of the homeless, don't you? And did you see Mrs. Pitts there that night? I certainly did, son. In fact, she won $25 in the very last game, just before 10 o'clock it was. No further questions. I'm sorry, Vera. It's not your fault, Father. God forgive me. He's just no good. You're a pervert, Walter, and you always have been. You steal ladies Mrs. under there, and you make me lie under God's Mrs. own. Pitts. I hope they put Mrs. you away Pitts. for a hundred Objection. years. Objection. Any cross-examination, Mr. Molensky? Uh, no, Your Honor. I'm ordering a ten-minute recess at this time. Mr. Molansky, in light of the testimony, I suggest you confer with your client and decide how you wish to proceed. I sincerely hope that you personally will have learned something from this uh, shabby chapter in the history of American jurisprudence. I'm real sorry, Mr. Molansky. Look, if you give me some time, I'll give you back the 500. I swear. 500. What 500? The 500 she gave me to give to you. Amy? Look, you weren't getting any clients, so I went down to the police station, you know, and I saw poor Walter here getting arraigned, and he looked so innocent. And he couldn't afford a lawyer, so... Yeah, and I already spent the money I stole from that dame. Great. Can I talk to you outside? 
just perfect. You buy me a client? How do I know who's going to turn on this I just don't want you buying me clients. I don't care how much money you got. If I can't make it on my own, then I can't. And that's just trying to help you. How many other clients you paid for? I've only had five since you opened the office two months ago. Six. Six clients. And how many of those did you put on your credit card? <laughs> don't be so... Oh, look who's here. Amy? Ken? How's it going? Uh, just wrapping up some trial work. Ken was terrific. I'm sure he was. How's your practice coming along? Some days are better than others. I lost my first seven cases in municipal court. Two of them were real embarrassments. You were there. You peeked in for a minute. Have you uh, heard about the Tony Franken murder? Hard to avoid. It's been all over the papers and TV. I'm representing the young man they arrested. Did he do it? Amy. It's a fair question. No, he didn't do it. Meanwhile... I could use some help if you have the time. I'm flattered. We'll fit it in. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Mason, if Ken's going to work on this case, then couldn't you make him co-counsel? Not on this one. Don't mind her, Mr. Mason. She means well, but sometimes she's a little pushy. What do you need? I need some investigative work. I'm never pushy. Great. Just tell me what to do. Well, they hired a local as night watchman theater who left his job the night of the murder to see some girl. Uh, find out about him. His not being there that night sounds just a little too convenient. Great. We'll get started right away. She can be your Della Street. Not a lot. No, they're all pretty much in the pop guy. Anything more on Tony Franken? until they showed Tony hadn't worked for over three years. Evidently, the producers didn't want the aggravation. I encountered it. I wonder why. Well, we'll run a check on the ex-wives. That's all. Who knows? Ten minutes and uh, Gavin would like to put it on its feet. Right. Uh, as you heard, I have about ten minutes. Will that do? So far. We can talk in my dressing room. Yeah, will you take care of this? Have at the door for you. Thank you, Uncle Bill. Well, how's it going? Pretty well, I think. Mel's new song is marvelous, and Gavin has some really smashing ideas. There was this tedious ballet in the second act, and he just took it out, and now the whole show plays better. It's incredible. You don't miss Tony Frank. Like I'd miss a migraine headache. Oh, I'm sorry. I know that sounds awfully cruel. Tony was a truly loathsome man. You really meant what you said about us being suspect? I'm afraid I did. You know, maybe none of this would have happened if Blaine had stepped in like he should have. You mean when Tony fired John? Blaine's let Tony walk all over him about everything. That's very strange. I once read where he fired a choreographer for slapping a chorus girl. Well, he's obviously changed. I did understand that he'd proposed marriage to you. Well, 
I didn't think that my private life was so public. Yes, he did. You see, his wife died a few years ago, and he said he... He thought he'd never remarry until he met me. That's very flattering, of course. But naturally, I turned him down. I mean, you can't marry a man without a backbone. I'm sorry to have to ask this. But where were you when Tony was murdered? My God. You really do think that I might have killed him. But why would I? Maybe because you knew Tony Franklin was planning to replace you in the show. We heard you'd received a disturbing call from the coast, so on a hunch, Della contacted your manager. He was unhappy about being fired and very, very talkative. My ex-manager has a very big mouth, and he probably told you that Tony and I didn't get along too well. But then nobody got along with Tony. But I didn't kill him, Perry. And I know Johnny didn't either. You seem very sure of that. Some things you just know when you got. It seems to me that being replaced would have been very painful for you, wouldn't it? An earthquake, my friend. You said you were a fan of mine, but I'm sure you haven't seen me at your neighborhood movie theater lately. You see, this business can be pretty rough on old broads like me. <laughs> I'd say that time very kind to you. Thanks. Well, if you'll excuse me, they want me back on the stage. We must get together sometime and have fun. I told you, it's the policy of this agency to respect the privacy of its clients. I don't want his tax return. Just his name. Parker what? I'm very busy, and I don't have time to argue with you. All right. This is confidential, but I'll tell you the real reason why I need to talk to him. While he was working at the theater, several of the actors reported having valuables stolen from their dressing rooms. Now, I'd like to ask this Parker some questions. I'm sure you'd like the police to know that you cooperated fully with our investigation. Yes, of course I would. Good. But you are not the police, and I would appreciate your leaving before I call them and charge you with harassment. simple thing and I strike out. His name's Parker Newton and he was kicked off the police force for brutality. He lives at 552 Morgan Street, apartment 4B. What? By the way, that woman is really very sweet. Here's his personnel application. Nice work. Now where will I drop you? I'm going with you. You just said this Newton was kicked out the force for brutality. All the more reason there should be two of them. I think the show has finally taken shape. Morale is way up. The new director put back the ballad Tony cut. It's Amanda's one real moment of vulnerability, and the show really needed it. I'll get right to the point, Mr. Walton. I'm told you came by Tony's room just as they were arresting Johnny Whitcomb. Yeah. I was delivering my script changes. I was up all night with him. What do I find? Tony's murdered? 
Johnny busted for it? <sighs> Talk about shock. I'm also told Tony was pretty hard on you. You or your work. <laughs> Mr. Mason, I come out of TV where everybody and his astrologer tells you how to do it better. You don't like it, but you get used to it. He intended putting his name on the show as co-author, didn't that bother you? Yeah, well, um, he never got the chance, did he? You couldn't be more right. Whoa, hey, I don't like where you're going. I'll tell you, Mr. Mason, if Tony had really tried something like that, he would have been up to his neck in my lawyers. Wouldn't it still have cast doubt on your ability to write for Broadway? Excuse me. Uh, Lieutenant Brock just phoned for you. Um, later, Mr. Mason? Later, Mr. Walton. What did Brock want? They've taken Leslie Singer in for questioning. The composer's wife? Mm -hmm. Washington finally matched the prince on Tony's glass. They belong to her. I won't let you do it. That's why we're here. It says he's 6'2", weighs 210. An ex-cop who brutalizes people. I'll just ask him a few questions. You know, what if you ask him the wrong one? Look, I'm not impugning your masculinity. I here. knew I shouldn't have let you come. Darling, I only want to help. I mean, I know you and everybody else think I'm just some rich little kid who giggled her way through college, but I'd like to show you that maybe I can really do something. You know, I mean, actually contribute. Look, why don't you sort of think of me as your Della Street? Security guard business plays better than I thought. Stay put. Dan! Remember brutality! Excuse me. Your name Parker Newton? What the hell is it to you? My name's Kim Alansky. I'm a lawyer. Congratulations, Mr. Kim Alansky, but that doesn't exactly answer my question, does it? No, Ken Molansky. I know you said that before. Yeah, well, you see, I work for another lawyer named Perry Mason. You might have heard of him. We represent the man who's accused of killing Tony Franken. So what's that got to do with me? Just want to know what you saw at the theater that night. Not a thing. Like I told the cops, I took over at midnight. See your girlfriend. Funny time for a date, isn't it? Look, Cassie works all day in this dress store. I was working all night at the theater, so we never get a chance to be together. Too bad you took off that particular night. Yeah. How was I supposed to know someone someone to get murdered? Not a damn thing ever happened in three weeks I was there. Where's your girlfriend work? Me and you just finished talking. I understand you used to be a cop. Look, punk, I told you. Get out of my face now. Move. Nice chat with you. Serious creep. Sure, like to talk to this girlfriend now. She works at some dress store. Molly's. What's this? The dress store. Very overpriced from what I hear, but I found it in the back of Newton's car, and I don't think they carry his size. Great. <laughs> Tell me where it is, and I'll drop you someplace. I told you I'm not droppable. Like it or not, we're in this together. Della Street, remember? Della Street. You can't even type. I've had her in there almost 45 minutes. Should be out soon, Mr. Singer. It's Mel. Thanks. Up at that. You wanted to know where I was. Tony was killed, right? That's right. I was working on the new song that Tony wanted. I couldn't have a piano in my room, so I was working in one of the lounges downstairs. Some of the staff must have seen me, or... Uh, <laughs> or 
hurt me. Didn't you resent it? Tony kept you coming up with new songs. No. This is my seventh Broadway show. I've probably written two, three songs for every one that was you. That's why they call it a triumph. You did your last... your last show in 1969. Yeah. Yeah, they sort of put me on hold. That is, until they had a show that needed music instead of noise. Actually, my whole life was on hold. Until I met Leslie, of course. Uh, Mel. Do you know why Leslie was in Tony's room the night he was murdered? Look, Mr. Mason, I have no illusions about why Leslie married me. I'm this semi-famous old guy with ASCAP royalties that'll roll in forever. But I married her because I love her. More than I've ever loved anybody else in my whole life, including my first wife, God rest her soul. And yeah, I know... She cheats on me. And yeah, I guessed about her and Tony. But I'll never confront her with that, ever. You see, I won't take the chance of losing her. Most men couldn't live that way. You mean you think I was the one who killed Tony because I was jealous? Well, why would I? There's always going to be another Tony. She didn't solve much of the puzzle. But somebody did call Tony Franken saying that Amanda Cody had tried to kill herself down at the theater. Franken goes down there. Mrs. Singer doesn't know if it was a man or a woman. Doesn't do very much to get your final hook up information. Apparently not. He uh, must have got to my place at uh, 12.15. And like you said, you know, we spent the whole night together. And you're sure about the time? Oh, I don't know. You know, maybe it was 1220. <laughs> uh, it, it was right around then. Excuse me. Okay. Thanks. She backed up a story. She seemed awfully like jittery, though. I think she's lying. Ken, look. Sign. We're out of your mind. Do you want to break this case or not? Of course I do, but I don't want you involved in something dangerous. Looking in that store is not dangerous. Shocking is. Amy, you've never worked a day in your life. Amy! minimum wage plus a 5% commission. You have a half an hour for lunch and don't use the phone unless we're on fire. No friends hanging around and if you're late, it comes out of your pay. Any questions? No. Do you have any experience? Uh, well, uh, let me put it this way. Valentino, Lester's Line, Dan Klein, Ongaro, he has some nice green silk, Donna Karen, Adolfo, and another Valentino. Years and it's great. No, Ken, Cassie's really sweet. 
I mean, she has to be to work for that witch. Anyway, it's like we're old friends. I tell her about us, and she tells me about them. Tell everybody about us. I had to get her confidence, didn't I? And I did. She's told me a lot. Like what? Well, like, sometimes she's frightened of Newton. Like, uh, he hates broccoli. Like, he works out at this gym called Harry's every day, and like, he's not even looking for another job, even though he still talks about getting married. He's not looking for another job, but he is driving a new Corvette. I'd sure like to get a look at his bank book. I'll see you tonight, okay? And then I discovered the weapon which was hidden in the mini bar in the defendant's hotel room. Lieutenant, I'm now showing you People's Exhibit 9, a 38 caliber revolver which Lieutenant Maxwell of your ballistics department has previously identified as the murder weapon. Is that the weapon you found in the defendant's room? Yes, it is. It has my mark. Were there any fingerprints found on this gun? No, because Whitcomb apparently wiped them off. Objection. Of Speculation, no foundation. Motion to strike. Sustained. The testimony after the witness's response of no is stricken from the record. When you first arrived at the defendant's room, Lieutenant Brock, was the door locked? Ah, uh, yes, it was. We need the manager's master key to get in. You see, it's the type of doors that lock automatically when they're closed. So, if some other person planted the gun in the defendant's room... They would have needed a key to get in. Thank you, Lieutenant. No further questions. Mr. Mason. No questions, Your Honor. So, what do you do? Oh, well, I'm an attorney. Yeah? Yeah. That's where I guess most lawyers could use the gym. <laughs> All that sitting around on the desk. Believe me, I know. I, I was wondering if you have anything like a trial membership. No. No. Try it out. Right now. No charge. Great. But I didn't bring my gear. But we'll fix you up. Hey, Willie. Hey, where do you see the machines we got? Other gems would kill for. <laughs> yeah, Willie, give Mr. Malinsky here some no, stuff. No, uh, Malinsky. Malansky, some stuff he can use to work out. Sure, this way. Great, I'll see you later. Yeah. Sir, did the defendant say anything after you pulled him away from Mr. Franken? He said uh, somebody ought to drive a stake through your heart. And then what happened? Then Tony asked him if he, Johnny, was going to be the one to do it, and he said, yeah, maybe. No further questions. Your witness, Counselor. Mr. Counter, why didn't you object when Franklin fired the defendant? I did. I told him that uh, Johnny was a damn fine stage manager. But you're the producer. Surely you could countermand such an arbitrary dismissal? Well, yes, I'm the producer, but... Uh, Ordinarily, the director has jurisdiction over the backstage personnel, and uh, I didn't feel that it was my place to interfere. Tony Franken was considering replacing Amanda Cody in your show, wasn't he? Well, I'd heard rumors to that effect. And would you have countermanded that dismissal? Objection. Hypothetical and irrelevant. Sustained. Mr. Counter... Could you describe for us the manner in which Tony Franken customarily dealt with creative talent? Tony was a bully. He was a marvelous director, but he was terribly cruel and uh, insulting to almost everybody he worked with. I have no further questions at this time, but I reserve the right to recall this witness. No questions, Your Honor. The witness is excused, subject to recall. Hey, new. And you really hung up on this place, aren't you? You think I want to turn into a tough about like you? Yeah. Let's find out who quits first.
Hey, I'm sorry. I really screwed up. I was working out. I must have lost my keys someplace. No problem. Which lock? Uh, this one. Right here. Thanks. I'll take care of you later. Tell you how many days you got to live. <laughs> what are you selling steroids? You can't afford that stuff, yeah. man. Come on. You kidding? Membership's up 20% over last month. Maybe even hooked a lawyer today. In fact, I better make sure. Hey, Maliski! Hey, funny you wouldn't. You got here, Harry. I think I'll pass on the membership. I'll get you, man. I'll get you. Mason. How'd it go today? Very well. The judge is going to allow us to put the victim on trial. The way I hear it, Tony Franken made enemies the way most people make friends. That's what I intend to show. I had a pretty good day myself. I got a look at Parker Newton's checkbook. You know, the security guard? Mm -hmm. There were two recent cash deposits of $25,000 each. The first deposit was made the day after Franken's death. The second deposit yesterday. Nice work. You sure getting paid for something. We find out who's paying. We got our killer. We better talk to Newton officially. Get this to the clerk's office, and you take it from there. Newton. Newton. Swell. You see, this is the directory. I enter all my notes and all of the summaries according to the case name. At, at least those for the last couple of years. Of course, if you want all of the cases in here, it's going to take me till the middle of the next century. By that time, computers will be obsolete. They'll be implanting chips in all the odd parts of our brain and skull. I wish they could find some for my knee. So do I. What else? Now, well, let's see. Two of Tony's ex-wives are happily remarried and living in New York. The third is a costume designer in London. And uh, here's a photo staff of that young actress who committed suicide. Her name was Vanessa Grant. She left a note saying she was pregnant and couldn't go on living without Tony. Of course, he denied the whole thing. A real prince. Oh, and look at this. Uh, Blaine Counter. His wife died four years ago. And they had a coroner's investigation. Cancer... Overdose of sleeping pills, self-administered. So, no charges were brought. No. Oh. Something else. James Walton's hotel bill as of yesterday. Some interesting charges, right? Very. Now... 
Why don't you tell your machine everything you just told me, and I'll be back soon. Oh, Della. If the machine comes up with the name of the killer, don't forget to make a note of it. I do for you. You have a few minutes? Oh, sure. Come on in. Uh, coffee? Uh, no, thank you. I don't want to interrupt your work. Oh, I'm uh, just getting started. It's a TV pilot I've got due next week. You're not working on Polly? Oh, no. <laughs> Ever since that last set of rewrites I did, that show has been frozen. Thank God. I'd like to show you something, Mr. Walton. a copy of my hotel bill. I just wondered why you've sent Kate Ferrara a dozen roses every night since rehearsals began. So, that's why you dropped by? Well, uh, the roses are part of a promise I made Kate. You see, at first we only wanted her for lead dancer, and she didn't want to do it. I promised if she would, I would send her a dozen roses every night. Well, she finally took the job when Tony let her choreograph, but meanwhile, I was stuck with my promise. Doesn't uh, this indicate more than a professional interest? <sighs> you got me. <laughs> it was more. Does anybody still use the word smitten? She was involved with Tony, wasn't she? What are you getting at? You think uh, I killed Tony because I was jealous? <laughs> Mr. Walton, people have killed for a lot less. Mr. Mason, you're barking up the wrong tree. Tony was finished with Kate. At the time he was killed, he was sleeping with Leslie Singer. So if anyone was going to be jealous, it was Mel Singer, <laughs> not me. Apparently, Mr. Singer has his problems. But then I believe so do you. I still consider both of you suspects. Thank you for your time, Mr. Walsh. What the hell? This is a subpoena requiring you to testify at Johnny Wickham's trial tomorrow. See you there. Tony was very abusive, and Johnny just lost control. But it was obvious that he didn't mean he was actually going to kill Tony. It's just one of those things you say in the heat of anger. Tony always provoked a lot of anger from everybody. I think he enjoyed doing it. From your knowledge of Johnny Whitcomb's character, do you think there's any possibility he could have with premeditation murdered Tony Frank? Johnny would be incapable of murdering anybody. Thank you, Miss Cody. I have no questions. Miss Cody, you may step down. Wait. Listen, I, I know Johnny couldn't have killed Tony because I was with Johnny all night. Why didn't you tell us that before? Because I had lied to the police and I... I told them that I'd been in my room sleeping. You see, I never thought it would go this far. And why were you in the defendant's room, Miss Cody? I was upset about him being fired. and I couldn't sleep anyway, so I... I went to his room about... 2.15 and... He was passed out on his bed, so I stayed with him until almost dawn. So you see, he couldn't have been at the theater and killed Tony. How did you get into the defendant's room? Oh, he'd uh, given me a key. How do you explain the defendant's own statement to the police that he did not get back to the hotel until nearly 3 a.m.? All right. 
I'll tell you the truth. The reason that I know Johnny didn't kill Tony Franklin is because I killed him myself. Miss Cody, is it true that Johnny Whitcomb is your son? Yes. Yes, we kept it a secret. I suppose... I didn't want my public to know I was old enough to have a grown son. It was stupid of me. But it does help us understand some of your behavior. I have no further questions. Miss Cody, you did not kill Mr. Franken, did you? No. But I can't just sit here. He didn't do it. But all these people out there think that he did. I... Miss Cody, we understand that you love your son. But this is not the way to help him. I'm going to ask you to step down now. I don't know whether the district attorney will be charging you with perjury or not. Your Honor, the district attorney's office has no interest in filing charges against this witness. Can you believe it? She wants $1,400 for this. <laughs> I mean, my boyfriend has to work a whole month for that. What about yours? Can you afford to spring up on Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Sure. What's the matter? I'm leaving town tonight. What'd you do now? Nothing. It's just getting a little too hot here, that's all. You're in trouble again, aren't you? Listen, no arguments. Just go home and pack, and I'll pick you up at your place at six. Baby, it's almost five o'clock. Just o'clock. do it, okay? emergency i gotta leave early okay you can't go it's still over half an hour before closing i know what I, I can't help it okay i'm sorry i i'll see you later <laughs> not here you won't you're fired what are you doing uh a wild guess using the phone no smart mouth remarks thank you and i told you no personal calls Telling you something. You have a terrible attitude problem. And your markups are obscene. Yes, four years ago. And at that time, your wife was quite ill, wasn't she? Yes, she had cancer. And when she learned her cancer was inoperable, you wanted to help her, didn't you? What the hell has this got to do with Tony Franken's murder? Mr. Counter, I'm sorry that I must ask you about this very painful time in your life. But I believe it is relevant to my client's case. Your Honor, he has no right. Please answer the question. When my wife learned the cancer was inoperable, she made me promise I'd help her. It was her idea. Help her how, Mr. Counter? Help her to end her suffering when it became too much for her. And eventually... It did become too much for her, didn't it? Yes. So you asked Tony Franken to get you some sleeping pills. I didn't know how else to get them without a prescription, and I knew that 
Tony was into the drug scene. And then... Look, what I'm going to say might get me in some trouble, but I guess it's about time I got it off my chest. I got the pills from Tony, and I gave them to my wife, and she decided to take them. And to this day, I can't say I'm sorry about it. I mean, she was in such terrible pain. <sighs> anyway, afterwards, everybody thought it was suicide, that she, she did it alone. Everyone except Tony. Is that why you hired him to again direct for you when nobody else would hire him? When he heard I was doing Polly, he hinted that if I didn't hire him, he'd make the whole thing public. And he continued to use that threat against you? At every opportunity. That's why I had to just stand by and let him fire Johnny. And you had no way of knowing, did you... How long he might continue to exercise this power over you? No. And you knew he was planning to fire Amanda Cody, a woman you'd asked to marry you? Yes. Wouldn't you say, Mr. Counter, you had a very strong motive to kill Tony? I'll say this, I've never been happier to see a man dead time of the murder, you were working in your hotel room alone, were you not? Yes. But it would have been very simple, wouldn't it, for you to leave the hotel and return without being seen? Probably, but I never left my room. But you have no witness to confirm that. Mr. Mason, when I first met you, you told us you considered some of us suspects, so I thought I'd better protect myself. You see... One of my investors called me that night from Honolulu to find out how the show was doing. Last week, I asked him to send me a copy of his phone bill. He sent me this. Now, it shows a long-distance call from Mr. McQueen directly to my room phone on the night of the murder. And you'll also see that, allowing for the time difference, we spoke from 2.15 a.m. to 2.39 a.m. Mr. McQueen will confirm that he was talking to me during that time period. No further questions? Miss August? No questions. Thank you, Mr. Connor. May we excuse? Goodbye. Ma'am, can you please move your car? Can I have an address? Maybe I'll come visit. We don't have an address. Now move your car. In a minute. No! All right, you don't have to yell. Boyfriend that night. 
think it's time you told the truth. He told me to say that we were together. Did he kill Tony Frank? No. But he knew who did. How do you know that? He, um, sort of surprised the killer at the theater, I guess. And, um, the man promised the money to keep quiet. He got the money. Fifty thousand dollars. And he was even trying to get some more. It was the man he saw, Cassie? I don't know. He wouldn't tell me. And you're sure it was a man? <laughs> I don't even know that. We should have heard from the hospital. Well, I'm sure Ken will call as soon as Parker Newton's able to talk. Anyway, shouldn't you be leaving for court? I still have half an hour. <laughs> Harry, you've been going over those papers forever. Don't know I have less to go on in this case than I've ever had. At this time, I know for a fact, a fact, my client is innocent. With all that, I'm still absolutely helpless. If I just hadn't taken those sedatives. Sorry, Mr. Mason. Newton died about 20 minutes ago. Didn't he ever regain consciousness? No. Rock had someone by his bed all night long. His girlfriend took it pretty hard, but I think she's going to be okay. That's it. What? You know who did it? Ken, I want you to do something for me, and fast. I need you back in the courtroom in 40 minutes. Who are you calling? Rock. I want him to contact the hotel security chief. Lieutenant Brock, please. Brock. Mr. Mason, we're waiting on you. I finally reached Factor's equity. I guess it's right on target. Mr. Mason, is there a problem? Defense calls James Walton. Any word from Ken? Do you solemnly swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth? I do. Mr. Walton, you are the book writer of the musical Polly? That's right. How did you get along with Tony Franken? Like most people, I suppose. He wasn't an easy man to like. Mr. Counter testified that he was often very harsh in his criticisms of your work. Yes, he certainly was. That annoyed you, did it not? Of course. But uh, it was just a part of his usual drill. Was his plan to claim co-authorship of the show also part of his drill? Objection. No relevancy. I tend to agree. Objection sustained. Please try to find a more relevant line of questioning, Mr. Mason. Certainly. Mr. Walton, what is the number of your hotel room? I'm in room 611. I would remind the court that Lieutenant Brock has already testified that the defendant's room is 511. Now, Mr. Walton, is there a fire escape outside the window of your hotel? Uh, I'm uh, not sure. Uh, maybe. Let me assure you there is. Just as there is one outside my client's room, just as there is one outside every room ending in the number 11. Objection. Relevancy. Your Honor, I am trying to establish that Mr. Walton's room was directly above that of the defendants, and that, therefore, Mr. Walton, through their mutual fire escape, had access to the defendant's room. An interesting point, Counselor. But what's your point here? To establish that Mr. Walton could have climbed down that fire escape and while the defendant was passed out, planted the murder weapon in the defendant's room and that he, of course, would have returned the same way. Objection overruled. Mr. Walton, 
Did you murder Tony Franken? Did you place the murder weapon in the defendant's room after that murder? I never even saw the murder weapon until this trial. No. I didn't murder Tony Franken. I was in my room the entire night doing the script changes Tony asked for. Mr. Walton, I'm given to understand that television writers are noted for their speed. Isn't it possible you finished those changes earlier than you say, early enough to have lured Tony Franken to the theater and then to have killed him? Objection. The witness has already denied he murdered Tony Franken. Sustained. Mr. Mason, I must say I've been very patient with your questioning of this witness. I appreciate that, Your Honor. But I must ask you to make your examination more on point or finish with him. I'd uh, like to request a moment for a conference with my co-counsel. Granted. But let me remind you, Mr. Mason, the word moment is capable of strict definition. Co-counsel. Of course, co-counsel. Sorry about the time that security bay wasn't too cooperative. It's all right. We're still in business. Uh, we are ready, Your Honor. Please proceed. Walton, do you do your writing on a word processor? No, I do. You saw me working on it. Does the program you use put a time and date on each file? I, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, maybe it does. I never really noticed. Maybe you should have. Would you identify this for us? Yes, this is a printout of my directory. There are some 13 files listed on this directory. After each one, there is a date and a time indicating the last time the file was worked on. Isn't that correct? Um, that's how it works. And here, after the file name Polly, it shows the date. The same date Tony Franken was murdered. Now, what was the hour? One thirty-seven a.m. Well, you did finish your work early. Early enough to have gone to the theater and taken Tony Franken's life. Now, that is true, isn't it? Objection. Asked and answered. Sustained. Is this as far as you can go, Mr. Mason? No, Your Honor. I intend to go a lot farther. Mr. Walton did indeed murder Tony Franken. It's crazy. What the hell motive would I have? Yes, that was also a problem for me. That is, until I had that visit with you in your room yesterday. Look, this was my first Broadway show. Now, now, why would I kill the director that was going to take it to Broadway and make it a hit and make me a fortune? A good point, Mr. Walton. No, you wouldn't kill such a man. But you would kill a man who was responsible for the death of your sister. Mr. Walton, can you identify the people in that picture? It's uh, myself, my sister, and um, my parents. Thank you. Hold on to that. I am now showing you a copy of a New York Examiner article and a photograph of a young woman that accompanies it. Can you tell me what the headline says? Actress commits suicide. And that actress was Vanessa Grant, and Vanessa Grant was really Edith Walton, and Edith Walton was really your sister, isn't that true? Yes, it's, it's true. I'm now showing you People's Exhibit 9. Identified as the murder weapon. You 
You recognize it, don't you? No, no. Here, take it. Now, do you recognize it? No. Your Honor, I would like to excuse this witness, subject to recall. Call Mr. Parker Newton to the stand. I'll get him, Mr. Mason. He's waiting out in the hall. All right. My sister used to kill herself. And you thought there would be some ironic justice if you used that gun, that same gun, to kill Tony Franken, isn't that right? I'm not sorry I did it. I'm only sorry that Johnny had to suffer through all this. Your Honor, the defense moves to dismiss all charges against Mr. Whitcomb. The state has no objection. Motion is granted, and defendant shall be released forthwith. Bailiff, take this man into custody. This court is now in recess. film version of our play. And I'll accept. If they'll let Johnny direct. Why not? He's certainly ready. <laughs> Amanda. Uh, uh, mother. Mother. Perry. Thanks hardly says it. It'll do. Oh. And we'll see you at the party after the show tonight? Absolutely. Uh, it's Cody. I'm told there's a great many press people out in the corridor. If you'd like to go through my private chambers, you can use another exit. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Johnny? Mother? I want to thank you for making me co-counsel. No. Thank you, co-counsel. We'll do it again. All out in the very near future. Does our very near future still include the ice skating you promised me? It does. <laughs> Hope it's not thin ice. 